Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, we had a super productive day of learning and conversation and reflection and community perspectives yesterday, and I expect uh, a lot more of that uh, today. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, Board Member Kura, can you lead us in the flag salute? Thank you. So we're going to go ahead and jump right into business with our first item, and it's a summer programming recap. Dr. Simon, you want to kick us off? Good morning, uh, Dr. Benitez, board president, Dr. Benitez, excuse me, <laughs> members of the board, Dr. Baker, executive staff into the LBUSD community. As always, it is an honor and a privilege to present to you. Today I will be uplifting a few extended school year, and we call it ESY, programs that were created for students with disabilities who receive ESY support. And my glasses are fogging, so I apologize if I'm fumbling. So let's start with our student enrollment numbers. So there are approximately 918 students who are enrolled in ESY who are supported by over 83 teachers. If you look at the breakdown by level, our preschool program, and I'm just speaking of Buffum, had 120 students. Our elementary ESY, which included sites Roosevelt, Grant, Garfield, and Webster, had around 277 students. The middle school level, Nelson and Lindbergh, 103. And then our high school students, Cabrillo, Jordan, Lakewood, McBride, Milliken, Polly, and Wilson, 262 students. And then last but not least, our adult community transition program, which is housed at Tucker, and also has satellite sites at Cabrillo, McBride, and Milliken had around 156 students. So we were pretty robust in regards to the number of students that attended ESY this summer. Very exciting. Now moving into the days of learning and program. Again, I'm gonna break down by level, elementary. We had ELA, English Language Arts, using culturally relevant text and student-focused themes. And during our assistant soup of elementary and early learning, Brian Moscovitz is going to talk about that and go in depth into those texts um, and the themes around that. We had math that covered key concepts in a math Olympics format, where students um, continued to build and strengthen their foundational number sense. We had science that engaged in enrichment exper experiments. And, you know, my passion, social emotional learning and also arts um, that uplifted the three signature practices, which are the welcoming activity. And in short, these are brief interactive experiences that bring the voice of every student into the room. They make a connection to one another and all the work ahead with each perspective. They have culturally rich voice being heard, and they're also respected and they learn from one another. There are also engaging lessons. And then lastly, the optimistic closure, which always aims to highlight an individual and our shared understanding of the importance of the work and can provide a sense of accomplishment and support forward thinking. And then we also use our functional academics, our unique learning systems, um, which our adult community transition um, program really utilizes to learn foundational skills, which also helps with their community-based instruction that I'll get into momentarily. At the secondary level, and also the adult community transition program, just like elementary, there were 19 days of learning um, and curriculum programming, and actually, our secondary schools, our high schools had um, more days of learning included. 
but there were just units that asked, you know, who am I as an expert and how can I share my expertise? Again, that integrated SEL embedded into the curriculum, um, that daily literacy practice, daily math lesson structures, um, functional academics that use universal learning systems that helped our students um, with special needs make progress in the general education curriculum. And then for our adult community transition program students, the community-based instruction, which we believe is monumental, and let me just delve into that momentarily. So community-based instruction, or better known as CBI, is for our students with disabilities who need instruction in functional skills and life skills. This instruction incurs in community environments and provides students with real life experiences. The goal, always with CBI, is to provide a variety of hands-on learning opportunities that will allow such students to practice essential skills. It will also determine the need for further instruction. So all these activities in the community support post-secondary education, employment, life skills, and also independent living goals. So during the fall and spring, and hopefully with COVID, we'll be able to get back into this, you'll see many of our adult community transition program start students working at um, organizations or businesses like Lazy Acres, like Marshalls, like Ross. So you'll see them walking and canvassing, catching our city buses to learn how to route themselves and acquaint themselves with the city. Um, and as I go into Lazy Acres, maybe sometimes to pick up a cup of soup or a sandwich, right, they're actually bagging <laughs> Uh, my food and my items and greeting folks as they're walking in. So it is a great experience. Um, our managers within our stores and other businesses really appreciate the support they receive and also learning from our students as well. So it's a win-win for all, but our students truly learn um, how to um, include themselves and acquaint themselves into the environment, how to be as independent as possible. And then we had our Spectrum non-public school um, who is uh, located at Lindbergh Middle School and also at Lakewood High School. They also serve on several other campuses in our district, but for the summer, they were only at Lindbergh and also Lakewood. So for them, Spectrum, if you don't know what Spectrum is, they offer a comprehensive educational program for school age students with autism, emotional and behavioral disabilities, intellectual disabilities, and other disabilities which require focused academic, behavioral, communication, therapeutic, and transition services. So at Spectrum Lindbergh, there are around eight students. These students were immersed into the system, into the program. The teachers were invited into the program to where many folks say it was very inclusive um, this year. They were included in the planning and the, the overall implementation of ESWAT. At Lakewood, there were two classes at 10 students each, so 20 all together, and again, Staff felt that they were included in health and safety protocols and planning, and students were, were able to immerse themselves um, and enjoy the campus as well with, with other students as possible. Um, the staff accommodated spectrum schedule, sanitizing and disinfecting classrooms, and setting up safety protocols as far as entering and exiting the campus. And then last but not least, I want to uplift and highlight even more so the Adult Community Transition Program, um, who had a partnership this year with Sowing Seeds of Change. And so in short, this organization aims to empower students and adults to discover and actively engage in a local food system that encourages healthy living, nurtures the environment, and grows a sustainable community through vocational training and leadership opportunities. Um, their primary objectives and vision are to employ transition age adults with disabilities and also foster youth ages 18 to 22 through a job readiness program, grow organic products, and host educational workshops for the neighboring community. So the ACT program was able to participate in a feel good salsa project. Um, and they felt it was a great success. Um, teacher Paul Nellis and several ESY students um, completed this work-based experience from ESY with so many seeds of change. Um, they grew salsa ingredients. So they grew the salsa ingredients, excuse me, and then made, packaged, and distributed salsa to all of the ESY staff. And I had a taste of it, and it was very, very scrumptious, just by the way. 
Also, uh, they also helped establish a community-based garden near Edison Elementary. The ACT program was super excited for this partnership and they're also excited to continue this partnership as well. And then here are just some pictures that highlight um, some of the classrooms um, for ESY. Um, this one um, specifically is for our grant ESY program that I was able to visit um, on several um, occasions just to meet kids, just to see them say hi. They were so excited to be a part of the science enrichment activities, again, the Math Olympics, and also just being around their peers um, and just having fun, right? For many of these students, there's nothing more than having um, that peer interaction and also being around um, that caring um, adult. And I believe that concludes my presentation. I think there's one more picture where it shows the fire drill that they had at summer school just for compliance and for other reasons. But again, the students were very excited to be a part of ESY. And now I'm gonna bring up Assistant Superintendent Brian Moskovitz. All right, thank you, Dr. Simon. Good morning. So you'll recall in the spring, um, Dr. Demina Myers-Miller and I had an opportunity to share with you kind of a preview of what was gonna be happening in our elementary summer SEAL program. So I'll go a little bit quicker, um, give my, more time to my colleagues, um, since you already saw a little bit of what, what's going on at elementary. Um, I think our SEAL program is a great example of the collaboration that happens in our district. Um, really, there's probably about 10 or 12 people who could be standing up here right now talking about elementary SEAL because we were all equally involved in the development and implementation. But just a couple of shout outs I think really need to happen. OCIPD, you'll, you'll see in a moment some of the resources they provided. Uh, Dr. Kale and her team just provided um, phenomenal resources for teachers to be able to implement. Um, on the kind of the business side, we had so many people um, supporting the deployment of all of the materials that are required to get out. So in those weeks right before SEAL, it was, it was kind of uh, overwhelming. But folks at, at TRC, people in uh, transportation, operations, really came together. Um, collaboration with the MS Kate office on what elementary SEAL would look like at the Kate schools, school sports services with Dr. Simon and Dr. Heenan, our research office, HR, to staff all of these folks. So I probably left somebody out, but just to, that's a little snapshot of the fact that in order just to do a program like this for 19 days, takes an all hands on deck approach, and that's what we had. Um, just a couple of the figures for you to see here. There were about 4,500 students that were involved in elementary SEAL across uh, elementary uh, K-8 and, and then in our ESY program at the elementary level with over 300 teachers. I had the opportunity to talk with Mr. Guardavascio with Long Beach Post during our SEAL program, and I told him at that time that 4,500 students is actually more than many, most districts in the state of California, and that was just for our summer program. So just a huge lift to bring back kids who had not been in person prior and some who had been. But it really, we saw it as a way to get kids back into engagement with in-person instruction. Those 19 days of learning, uh, you heard Dr. Simon already referenced some of the, the focus areas, the ELA with culturally relevant texts, math with a math Olympics theme, and then some really engaging science, um, which I'll show you some resources. So at this time, uh, at the bottom there, it talks about resources. If you look at the packet right behind, uh, the, I do not have slides for this, but I gave everyone a snapshot of some of the resources that the OCIPD team uh, developed and, and deployed to our, um, to our teachers. So it looks like, this is kind of the front page, if you look up on the screen, the front page says, Imagine a Better World. So I'm gonna ask you as board members, just take about two minutes or so, skim through the documents, and then I'll just bring you back and highlight a couple of the pages that were um, in the packet. But just kind of skim through and see the types of resources teachers received. And I apologize, Mr. Otto, I numbered the pages on the first slide deck, but not on this uh, supplemental one. So I'm gonna have to just reference a section. You'll have to follow with me. <laughs> Can you 
No, I'm talking, but I'm talking on the supplemental one that I gave you. Uh, sort of. The number, the number doesn't necessarily go in order, but that's okay. I thank you for the credit. There are numbers on the bottom. They just don't necessarily mean anything. All right, so again, just kind of a skim through. I just want to point out a few of the pages. So the very front page that all teachers received, that we had this theme, imagine a better world. And then you can see each week there was a weekly essential question we engaged students in. What can I do to make the world better? What can a community do to make the world better? What can be created and invented to improve our world? And what is my vision for a better world? And imagine engaging kindergartners, first graders, second graders, and thinking about what they can do to impact their world and make it better. So it's really cool stuff. Um, if you, again, I'm going to just say in the fourth page in the packet, you'll see this is a, a, an example of the weekly um, lesson plan for the teacher. But you can see the text. The text that we gave to students, and they all received their own copy of it. This is a third grade text. The third grade text was kids who are changing the world. And it was, it's, uh, it was a series of vignettes about students who are changing the world. The following page talks about, um, the chapter one was meeting Jaquil Naeem Jackson. And it talks about what uh, this student, this child is doing to improve homelessness in their community. Um, and this was what our students were engaged in in their language arts section. Um, even in math, I'm sorry, in science, and there's a science page further on, talks about in science, what role do scientists and engineers play in making our community better? So uh, really just across um, a curricular approach to thinking about how we can engage our students. And we, we see this really as a way, and, and again, huge appreciation to OCIPD, what they were implementing in SEAL was just a snapshot of what we're going to engage in during the regular school year from a curricular standpoint. So a couple of statistics before I hand it off to, or some, some feedback, if you will, before I hand it off to Dr. Lund. Um, just we, we surveyed our students, we surveyed our teachers. Um, our students, 97% of them, over 97%, said they feel, felt their SEAL teacher cared about them and their learning. That's a pretty good number. Um, over 85% of students were extremely or very happy. 13% said somewhat. And then we asked them to give some uh, longer responses. You can imagine students were saying things like, I didn't really want to wake up early in the summer, uh, things like that. But then they said, but I actually enjoyed myself. So that's good. Um, and then most importantly, I want to bring you to some quotes from teachers. I know it's a little bit small on the screen. Um, I think it's really critical. First of all, huge, um, huge show of appreciation for our teachers. After an incredibly trying year, we had over 300 teachers step up to teach in the SEAL program. And that's, that's asking a lot of them because they were exhausted. We had staff, uh, principals, counselors, uh, office staff, custodians that, that came on board for this. So obviously it couldn't have happened without our teachers being willing to do it. So great appreciation for them. Um, but just some quotes. Th these three quotes I think were very um, representative of all of the quotes that we received from teachers in that feedback. And I'll just read a couple of points. Uh, one teacher said, um, <clears throat> our principal, I'm sorry, it was great experience and gave me immense insight in how our students will possibly res be responding to class in class instruction in the fall. So they saw it as a way to really for them to start getting a sense of what it will be like to return to in class. Another teacher, the second sentence, I think I learned a lot of new teaching strategies during SEAL that I will incorporate into next year. So teachers often will take this as an opportunity to try out new things and maybe a little bit more of an informal environment, and they then learn some skills that they'll be bringing into their classroom this next year. And then what I'll uh, read the last sentence of this, this last one here. The excitement and progress I saw in my students every day as they worked with hands-on math, science, ELA, SEL, and even exercising for the Olympics has been priceless. And we did hear from teachers just the amount of growth they saw in their students in those 19 days. So just a, a, a quick uh, few photos there. Again, we, we could have taken thousands and spent more time talking about it. Um, but just a, a great collaborative effort that I think was a very successful um, initiative within our district. So we'll do questions at the end, but I'll hand it off to Dr. Lund to talk about the middle school program. Good morning. I'm going to spend the most of my time actually giving, uh, handing it over to Nock Wynn, who is our administrator from our summer SEAL program at Rogers, uh, was the assistant principal at Rogers last year, will be our assistant principal at Wilson High School this coming year, to really lift up uh, her experience and the great summer program that she ran at, uh, at Rogers. So first of all, special thanks to our ELA and math uh, teachers who really stepped up this summer to run a math preparation program for the upcoming math school year targeted to our math six, math seven, uh, and eighth grade math courses. 
our ELA teachers who ran a writing program this summer, and our extensive number of elective teachers who stepped up to offer a wide range of enrichment courses for our students. Our SEAL administrators, uh, who really took on an enormous lift to run a program at every single school site this, this summer. And then to our middle school team, uh, especially Dr. Cecilia Santos Camarino, who really organized our summer SEAL program. George Sai, Nora Valdez, uh, Diva Morillo, and Jeanette Sanchez in our office, who really supported the, the program itself. So as I mentioned, we ran a program in every one of our MSK-8 schools. Uh, we ran five different programs this summer. We ran a SEAL program, we ran a STEAM program in 10 schools, we ran an ESI program that uh, Dr. Simon alluded to in two of our schools. We had an ABC Scholars program in six of our schools, and then Lindbergh had the uh, Freedom School as well as the Spectrum School. So Lindbergh actually had six different programs this summer. We had about 2,500 students participating in, in our Summer SEAL, STEAM, and ESY program. About 25% of them were actually brand new to in-person learning. These students had not returned with us in the spring, but did come in summer to participate in in-person learning. So I thought that was uh, an important statistic. We had some very large sites. You see a number of sites that had over 200 plus students, and we ran over 30 plus electives across our, uh, across our schools. Some very creative courses that you see listed, coding, automation, cooking, marine biology, gaming, anime, some things to really engage students. You see that reflected in the data itself. Um, how often did you attend summer school? You can see we had some students that were there essentially every day, roughly three-fourths of our students, and a number of students that were there, what they determined as sometimes, uh, which could obviously greatly vary across students. These numbers highly correlate to their level of satisfaction. So students who really extremely enjoyed or uh, were really very happy with their summer SEAL experience mirrored exactly the attendance, which once again does not surprise you, right? If you enjoy the courses you're attending, you're gonna be there every single day. And similar to elementary, 97% of our students uh, indicated that their summer SEAL teachers cared about them, demonstrated that they cared about them during the summer SEAL program, which I think is exceptional. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to Nock Wynn, who's gonna lift up our Rogers Summer SEAL program. Um, and you have a, an amazing yearbook that they put together in just 19 days capturing that experience. Nock. Thank you, Dr. Lund, for the opportunity to uh, present. Um, good morning, President Benitez, uh, members of the board, Superintendent Dr. Baker, uh, executive staff. Uh, so. Uh, Really, this work really highlights the phenomenal team, both certificated and, and classified staff that we had at Rogers Middle School to really run this, uh, what we called summer camp, building connection and community. And we were really reimagining what school could be like. Um, and so anywhere from redefining, instead of students, we use campers. Instead of teachers, we said camp leaders. Instead of periods and classes, we said rotations. All of that was still within the context of the schooling experience, of course, but reframing that so that we kind of shifted some even, some power dynamics uh, when we created this community. So. Uh, looking at our demographic of students, uh, the racial makeup of our Rogers students, you can see that uh, in the left, the light blue is what our racial makeup of our Rogers students would be in this upcoming academic school year in comparison to the students that we served. And so um, we had more of our black and Latinx students who represented our SEAL program. And of those 107 students that participated, 16% of students had an individualized education plan or classified as special education uh, or had a 504 plan. And that was phenomenal because one of the great opportunities that we uh, created was that all of the students were mainstream. Despite that they were classified as MM um, or any other uh, accommodations that we needed. Um, they were all mainstream, which was super powerful because even the, the students themselves didn't know, right? And then the, the teachers, phenomenal that one of our math teacher commented that she had a phenomenal math student and she was surprised that that student had an IEP. And so those are some things that allowed us as we created the small space to then also follow up with our students. Um, to support them this upcoming fall. 
And so why camp, right? So why camp? So there's this quote by Dr. Michael Ungar that says, perhaps, best of all, camps offer kids a chance to feel like they belong. All those goofy chants and team songs, the sense of common purpose and attachment to the identity that camps promote go a long way to offering children a sense a sense of being rooted. So we did all these goofy things, right? Our staff did that, so that way our, our students was able to feel comfortable, comfortable to uh, try a lot of different new things. And so um, that was our framing. And so how do we how do we do that? So we also had camp names. So I was not Miss Wynn at camp. I was Marshmallow, uh, and all, all the other staff also had different names. And so even that term, right, uh, brings joy, a do, new sense of identity. And so so camp names for staff and students if they chose, uh, camp songs, camp chants, group activities, uh, group identities. Each student was designated for a specific color, and so we did a lot of grouping. Always played music at the entrance and exit. And as you notice on the slide, uh, there's a guess who. We did play guess who, guess, guess the, the staff member. And if you notice on this slide, there's actually an eighth grade student that served as one of the staff members, which was phenomenal because we then had one eighth grader that served as our intern uh, and really developed these, these, these hands-on learning skills, career-based experiences from curriculum development. Uh, for the first time, we focused on public speaking. Public speaking. She went on the school intercom for the first time, made announcements to her peers. We gave her a radio. We gave her a radio, taught her radio etiquette. Uh, so the empowerment and the enrichment of not only what she got out of it, but the support for us to run this program. We really needed Adriana that, this, this summer. And so I also want to highlight one of the things that she said. So she said, Miss Wynn, thank you so much for everything you've done to help me. I was finally able to figure out what to do in life that I wanted. I've learned so much and I've been led in the right path. I'm so, so grateful for everything you've taught me and will miss you so much. Thanks so much for everything. And her name was Squishy and she'll say, I'll, I'll miss you. So she'll be an eighth grader, but she'll be phenomenal um, next year uh, as she Develop, develops her leadership skills. So shout out to Adriana. I know you're prob your dad's probably watching right now. Uh, and also continuing fostering a camp environment. Birthdays, oh my goodness. If you're a summer baby, you don't get to celebrate your birthdays. And so you best believe we celebrated the kids' birthdays in the summer. Uh, and so we had 14, 14 birthday celebrations. And campers of the week, this was phenomenal. We had the peers select peers. Uh, and so the awardees, the students were selecting who should be the camper of the week based on that characteristic trait that we had for that, for that week. Uh, again, redefining terms, um, emphasizing risk taking and trying new things. All of that, of course, incorporates the SEL practices, Dr. Simon. Uh, we had our Seal Friday activities. I wish I could show you the talent show, a phenomenal, all the students had to go up on stage and perform something. Uh, we would have done this, but we didn't. Um, but Mr. Hamilton, our music teacher, is phenomenal. Taught the students how to read music, um, play the drums, and all three classes played for the first time. Um, in less than 19 days, less than 19 days. It's phenomenal. It's on YouTube if you want to search for it. So uh, as a result, many of our students opened up, made connections, and really came out of their show this summer. Students new to Rogers that we didn't know historically had been un unsuccessful at their prior school really showed engagement, and our teachers were really intentional about focusing in and building those relationships with those students. Our summer teachers even drafted a student concern document, so that way we can follow up with students that we know, hey, this is what we found in the summer program. Let's get ready for the fall. Uh, and certain students will also be paired up with certain teachers as we got to know students. What are the students' needs that are going to meet some teachers' need, teachers that are going to better support that particular student. So then I want to leave you um, with a quote from a sixth grade parent. He said, my daughter really enjoyed the program at Rogers. My wife and I both feel that it was very valuable for her in terms of her preparation for next year and starting middle school off with confidence and on the right foot. Thank you for everything that you and your team did in terms of putting this program together and conducting it so successfully. Thank you so much. It's always tough to follow a former ASB director and someone who still helps run Poly North. 
Uh, but I will try my best. Great job. Thank you, Nock, for that great presentation. Uh, good morning, President Benitez, uh, board members, Dr. Baker, and exec staff, and Long Beach community. Um, our high school uh, program this summer was very unique in, in that we, sorry, everyone's dropping this, so I thought I'd add to the uh, ratio here. Uh, it was very unique, as you know, we were in distance learning, and then at spring break, after spring break, we had an opportunity for our seniors to come back to in-person learning, uh, and our percentages varied from our f uh, seniors to our ninth through 11th graders of about 40% at our highest, 43% of our highest in-person ratio at some of our high schools to as low as 21%, 22% some of our high schools. So we knew uh, as we moved in working with providing summer support for our schools that it was gonna be a huge challenge to be able to bridge the gap and you know just do a lot of the work that ne our students needed, especially with the high rates of Ds and Fs that our students received the first semester and Ds and Fs the second semester uh, of last school year. So we had a really unique opportunity. I want to thank uh, Dr. Baker and the team and all of you uh, as of the board to really support us in funding a unique situation in that we were able to provide summer school and enrichment at all of our high schools. Typically, we only have summer school at our six comprehensive schools. So if you go to McBride or Renaissance or other schools, you typically had to go to one of your local comprehensive high schools. So this was very unique in that we had an opportunity to host enrichment and summer school at all of our high schools. So with that um, allowance, the challenge became, are we going to have enough staff, right? That was our, uh, we, were, we were getting to the point to at the end of June that the, the state opened up. We were in better situation towards the end of the school year last year. Um, and we were really worried about the uh, staffing and being, being able to bring the supports for our students over. Uh, I want to thank Sashia Tulo, uh, Carol Ortega, uh, our administrators, and especially our teachers who really went out of their way to support these programs that we were able to offer. It was a huge challenge uh, and an undertaking because again, it was how do we come back to schools and how do we open up and, and support our students for uh, our summer bridge and enrichment. So in the first slide here, and you know, Brian mentioned also, it, it just took all of us together to collectively communicate. Sometimes, you know, missteps here and there, but I, I think for the most part, we did a really good job of getting as many people on board. Uh, some of our administrators took on roles of teachers in various levels, not just at the high school level, but different levels. Administrators went back into the classroom to support our students. So in the first slide here, you can see that our number of students, so, yeah, thank you. Our number of students that uh, went in person at our high schools were 4,420. We had 3,112 students uh, uh, take on APEX, which was v virtually uh, in, uh, and distance learning. Um, then we had about 504 students, as Dr. Simon mentioned, in special ed that not, were not only in just traditional summer school, but also in our enrichment courses that we're even still offering at this moment now as we speak. So we had a total of about 8,036 students involved in some type of uh, summer school, traditional summer school and, and or enrichment. So we're really proud of that. We have the great distribution at the bottom. Uh, and I've, in the rest of the slides, you can see all the courses and offerings that all of our schools provided uh, and won't go into great detail of every single school and what they've all, but just wanted to make sure that we were very transparent and open to share the hard work that went into uh, providing supports for our students this past summer. Um, as we walk classrooms, uh, I, I'm Dr. Lund and uh, Mr. Moskovitz and I have agreed as we as had meetings with Dr. Baker and the team, the real eye-opener to see as we went into these classrooms uh, is that a lot of our in-person learning still became that distance learning feel in our classrooms, and really no fault of anyone, right? It was our transition of having students come back as we opened in the spring for students to return to in-person learning. Our, some of our students didn't, so some of our students that came to summer school for in-person support were actually, it was their first time coming back to a school site in over a year. Uh, and that was really eye-opening. Uh, I want to thank the teachers who have allowed us to come into rooms and ask them what they did with students. And a lot of them really did so much work in connecting with our students, asking them what they did in the last couple, uh, a couple of months, the last school year at home. What supports did they have, not have at home? What they missed the most about not being in person? So they went out of their way to really team build and connect with our students by you know, talking to them, interviewing them, providing supports. Um, and it was, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a little bit of a eye opener for us to really consider what we're going to do when we open schools up in a couple of weeks. Because again, we will have a lot of students who will be in person for the first time. We've had opportunities in the spring, we had opportunities this summer, and we still have students that have yet to step on our school campuses uh, since we closed on March 13th of 2020. 
So I, I, that's one of the things that I know we've been working closely with and being able to provide our art staff and our students uh, um, an opportunity to really get to know each other with SEL work and all that team building and class building we're going to have to do and build relationships again is to really support our students and teachers into you know in person teaching one one more time. I was I was had an opportunity to. Uh, interview uh, or see a teacher that I've worked with uh, many years ago at Washington as teachers together and she was teaching summer school uh, and she's a middle school teacher and you know even with our middle school teachers who are very strong still had that zoom distance learning feel in the classroom because that's what we're accustomed to doing now so you would think that's something that we learned so quickly so fast has become part of our uh, of uh, the way that we do things together uh, some teachers have asked hey when can we have students do small groups and sit together and collaborate and, 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 and wait so some of our teaching staff are waiting and excited to be able to do group work with their students but again as, as we follow our mandates that we have to follow our protocols it's going to be an interesting uh, and challenging way of, of bringing our students back not just what we learn from in person in the spring but to what we learn in summer school and in enrichment so just wanted to share that information and I want to keep us on time too Dr. Benitez I know we're a little bit over but wanted to open up also open up to any questions any of you might have from our four presentations that we had this morning because I'm sure you're ready for questions. Yes, Dr. Camarino, thank you. And, and yeah, I think we're gonna have to push back here a little bit on our uh, agenda, but uh, yeah, let's open it up for questions, comments, discussion. Well, I'll just start by saying I love the idea of um, a camp theme for our, our middle school students. I can't imagine how much fun that was, not just for the students, but for the teachers as well, and for the staff um, to provide a fun, informal feel to this educational experience. I love that. I know how much camp has meant to my own kids and the impact that that has had on their lives. And I'm sure this is an experience that they will remember for a very long time. And it's very fun hearing about all that. Yeah, thank you all for the overview. I, I heard nothing but wonderful things from parents all summer and that hasn't always been the case over the last 18 months or so, um, but just a universal appreciation. So I just wanna thank, like you said, the teachers and the staff who after a really challenging year chose to step up and try and support students in new ways, um, to try and connect with students who they haven't had the opportunity to connect with, welcome them to new campuses. Knock, you knocked it out of the park as usual. Um, as I said, you went full ASB director on the middle school and <laughs> But clearly those strategies engage kids in ways that other things don't. And so we learn so much from you and for your peers who, who take a leap and do something that seems so unconventional, but has really extraordinary results. And not necessarily in the academic performance, but in bringing kids into community. So even thank you for referring to building community with these kids over the summer. Um, it's a tremendous inspiration and challenge for us as we move forward to look at all of the opportunities that we can do uh, things like that in non-traditional ways. But to everyone who, who supported students and staff and school sites and food and all of those things, I know our nutrition services was very busy this year as well or this summer keeping people fed both in the community and on our school sites. I'm, I'm really grateful because it's been important. I asked uh, Nock if she was ha able to get some time away because not all of the staff are as busy as we've all been to be able to bring our full selves to kids and to help them build community where we have to do some self-care, especially in this time. So to everyone who contributed to supporting a small school district, a medium-sized school district over the summer, I'm really grateful. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I understood what you said about how uh, the, the distance learning factored in in terms of what, what, what the expectations are, what, what, is that gonna calm down or is that just a, a new part of the way we're gonna be doing things? And yeah, thank you for that qu clarifying question. So basically what it looked like, it was just a lot of students with uh, f heads and faces into Chromebooks yeah. versus the traditional, um, you know, doing some cooperative learning, teaching in front of the students and moving around the room. There were a lot of students in Chromebooks most of the time now. Granted that we do have a Canvas page that all of our students access their assignments and their work and independent practice, you know, doing independent practice on the Chromebooks, but there were just a lot of situations in, in which you walked classrooms and students were in 
Chromebooks versus engaging one another, having conversations, working with actual mm -hmm. implement tools, pencils. Uh, there was one young, uh, uh, young one group, a, a young lady that was working at McBride that was using a glue stick, and, I, and she was a senior, and I leaned over to her saying, do you know how to use that? And she started laughing, saying, yeah, I don't, we didn't use this on Zoom. So it was something funny that she shared even when visiting her classroom at McBride and having to actually use a glue stick to put something together. Is that the future, or, or is it something that they'll, they'll move away from as everybody's back in class and stuff? Do you have any sense of that? I'm just, it's, about, it's a cultural question. Yeah, I, I think it's more moving away from as we are able to, um, you know, as this, we get over this pandemic, I think we'll be able to be more relaxed and being able to move freely around the, um, okay. around the classroom. You know, obviously we have people, people that feel differently. Some people feel very comfortable in moving around classrooms, others that have reservations. So in, in that support, with not just staff, but students too. So right. we want to honor and respect uh, all those feelings as we go through this pandemic mm -hmm. and really seeing that not just having in-person means we're getting better, we just have to even change the way that we all feel about being outdoors and being, you know, around and being and socializing. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Jay, I'll, I'll start with you and then uh, maybe we can hear from the, the other level head uh, offices. So um, I'm, I'm very interested in what insights and learnings we take from this transitionary summer. Uh, and a, a lot of you alluded to it and, and how does that inform what we do uh, beginning in two weeks. So let me start with you, uh, Jay, because um, I like that you know we, we got a sense of sort of eye openers, uh, right, because many students over the summer had not participated uh, in in-person spring. So um, what do we take away from this grade distribution, mm. uh, Jay, and how does that inform uh, not just the academic side, but a lot of the social and emotional support that all of you uh, refer to in terms of the student experience, right, the student engagement uh, piece. How, how, in essence, how do we convert this summer camp uh, experience into a sort of more of our daily experience given um, the great distribution that you shared with us, Jay, and I appreciate you sharing it school by school. Yeah, um, no, my, my pleasure. I, I think it started with Dr. Lund's work and doing what, you know, uh, in, in the way that we approach grading. We, I think we as a system, we are gonna calibrate on what grades really mean. Does it mean compliance or does it mean learning, right? So we know that if a student does X, Y, Z throughout the semester for high school in particular, they get a certain grade, but I would argue too that if you uh, were to fail all your tests and assessments all the way through the school year, but the last two weeks of school, you could demonstrate that you, you can pass these assessments and get all A's that the students would pot potentially be able to you know, receive an A in that class. That would be some challenge to argue with some of our teachers, and I respect the reasons why you wanna b build discipline and everything else and routines into students so that they don't fall behind and have to do things last minute. It also puts a lot of responsibility on our teachers to have to now grade these assignments when we don't have a a sequence, right, or, or order to how we do things. So really it goes back into what we consider being essential learning versus essential assignments. And I think we learned that when we closed in March 13th of 2020, when we had those la that last quarter of school left and what assignments were going to be graded, were not going to be graded. And I think the key there, there began with essential learning for the last quarter of the school year versus essential assignments. And a lot of us in our routine sometimes have these critical assignments that we know embed a lot of standards that we think are important for students to know. But sometimes we got to, you know, we have to kind of really balance the whole essential assignments versus essential learning and standards that our students need. So that I, we just have to repurpose and recalibrate how we do those. Yeah, and, and, and I'm thinking about the iReady uh, mm -hmm. presentation that we got from Mr. Yes. Brown yesterday, right? How do, we tr how do we think through that, right, in terms of what we're assessing as mm -hmm. student learning versus just the compliance of some of these academic indicators that really are difficult to apply uh, right now in this context. Chris, any thoughts? Yeah, so actually one of the things that the research office is going to work on this year is correlating grades to student growth and student learning and doing a bunch of work with teachers and community members around what a grading policy might look like in LBUSD, especially a grading policy from the lens of equity. Mm -hmm. And so trying to do that calibration, but making sure we do it with community input, with teacher input, and with data around correlations between grades and student learning mm -hmm. uh, as we come towards the spring semester. So you'll hear more about that as we move through the year. Yeah, and I have all these buzzwords, uh, Chris, that you used yesterday um, that I, I honestly would, you know, would consider rethinking, right? Terms like catching up, uh, right? Terms like falling behind. All right, it, it, it's difficult to reconcile within this learning acceleration uh, environment and context and climate that we wanna promote, uh, you know, whether that be growth mindset work, uh, whether that be the additional enrichment 
uh, work that really, I think that's, that's going to be the biggest academic challenge for us, right, in this transition to in-person, that there's not this narrative or this feel that I'm always behind and I'm trying to catch up, or somehow I fell way behind, and the disincentive be behind, you know, receiving Ds and Fs, uh, right, on an ongoing basis, like, uh, and I'm not just talking about a college career readiness, I'm talking about overall social emotional health of, hey, I, I'm starting off with Ds and Fs uh, here. And so um, I'm, I'm wondering if I can hear from, from the other level head offices, like, so, you know, how are we thinking about measuring our success, right, vis-a-vis -vis that uh, we can't think about grades uh, and our traditional academic indicators in the same uh, way? So any, any takeaways from the summer that we can, we can use in, in this coming year? Yeah, I would lift up uh, three key practices. Um, one, in terms of access to electives and enriching electives that really keep kids engaged in school. Uh, so really expanding elective options. We're pushing a lot of our intervention courses into a zero period so students can still have an elective option during the school year. The second would be for that knock so uh, eloquently lifted up is around relationships. So I think about the SE, uh, SEL lessons, the um, that curriculum office has built into our guides around building relationships with students, building community. I think about our restorative work at the middle school level and lifting that up in terms of building relationships and how do you uh, become uh, restorative in your work. So implementing restorative practices, but also becoming restorative, becoming an equity-driven uh, leader, equity-driven teacher in the system. And then third, uh, as it relates to curriculum, really the great job that our curriculum leads lifted up in terms of math development courses. So some of the shifts that Becky Afghani has done to our math development course uh, for this coming school year, as well as Jennifer Crockett as, a, as uh, a way of lifting up writing, which I think goes to your question around assessment. So we're incorporating uh, some new writing assessments this coming year and using that as a true sort of performance task uh, as an authentic measure of student learning so that would be one way of kind of measuring that sort of progress throughout the year. Great. I'll say briefly at elementary, if you wait 10 minutes, I will tell you exactly some ways that we're going to be using our staff. No more elementary homework? No more homework, no. Okay. But, well, I can't say no more homework, but we are, we are looking at how we do things differently. Uh, and I think we, what we learned in SEAL is, as you already heard, the, the relationships, the curriculum, the text that students connect to, the critical thinking that allows students to think about where they fit into the world and what their role is in supporting their community, supporting their school. Um, I, I think we definitely learned some uh, things, our teachers learned some things from the summer program that we'll be able to grow out into our school more broadly. And Dr. Bernandez, let me add one thing too from a K-12 perspective, just really a timely question. Yesterday, Dr. Kale and team um, sent out to every teacher in the entire school district um, supports for a restorative restart in curriculum and that is meant to really empower teachers to come into this school year in a different way to come in thinking about relationships to come in thinking about community to come in thinking about care and not to come in thinking that the expectation is in the first few weeks that they are you know back in a in a place where it looks like a few years ago school where we see assessments and homework from summer do we are we do not want to see that we want our teachers to come in and find their own you know health in their classrooms as well as provide that support for students and really focus on building community and restoring and and bringing students into the classroom in a different way so uh, thanks to ocipd for that that curriculum thank you for that dr baker and i just want to to call this out um specifically that's all teachers that's every single classroom every single program every single teacher and student. It isn't segregated or separated out for different programs or different levels. That's ev that information and that expectation is on every single classroom in the district, correct? Yes, it is. And, and I'll just say it again. Teachers are empowered to think about the opening of school in a very different way. Um, and, and that empowerment uh, um, allows them to think about the resources that they have, build upon them, add their own thinking that they've done since the Equity Institute this summer, but to really feel empowered that we want to see different in classrooms in a way that respects them and the, the coming back to work for them and respects the needs of our students. So. Thank you, Dr. Baker. One quick question. I'm curious, Dr. Lund. Um, what do we account for the um, additional students of color participating in the Rogers uh, summer camp as compared to the 
regular academic year? I would probably defer to Nock to actually okay. answer that question. AKA Marshmallow. <laughs> yes, Dr. Reed, it is. Uh, yes, so we were strategic in our outreach. And so we targeted, we had invitation letters. So we, tar we targeted based off of, there was no SBAC data that we could take, but we targeted GPA. And so, as you know, in our equity issues, our students, our black and Latinx students uh, in comparison um, would be majority in those low GPA. And so that's probably why you saw that. So it was really targeted, but then it was also open to any students that wanted to attend the program. So, sounds to me like a good intervention strategy to sort of follow uh, and lead by, right? Thank you. Yeah, but I just also want to highlight, Dr. Benini, what you're saying about we need to stray away from this deficit thinking, right? This learning loss right because it's not learning loss the students are coming to us with so much learning and asset base that they, they they learn so much and so reframing that the same way that we reframe the camping as we return and redefine things we're going to see so much growth because we're going to raise a bar and have those high expectations for all of our students thank you miss Nguyen. thank you everyone yeah great job uh okay let's let's um, move on to our next item uh, here which is our learning acceleration and support plan Thank you. So I'm going to introduce the next hour um, with a focus on learning acceleration and support plan. And I just want to reflect from the spring. You'll recall that we spent five, uh, we had five sessions and board meetings to build your knowledge and to build the district's knowledge of the learning acceleration and support plan. In addition, just want to remind everyone that, that we were very strategic in thinking about our LCAP as well as our, um, the approval of the district budget with the new funds that have come in to support learning acceleration and support in the development of the plan. As promised, since we've been together in board session, as promised, by August 1st, we would publicly post our plan. And so um, for the community, you can find the learning acceleration and support plan on our district website in its professional form. Um, and so today we're gonna open just with a, a little video, about 90 seconds that share what we'll share with the community um, in, in publicly pushing out the plan for folks to be able to um, to be able to access and then our staff our teams are going to um, at your request in previous meetings walk you through a core initiative at each of the levels so you get the feel for how this actually um, will support students directly that crosses over pillars and so you can see how the integration and the quality of that went into planning actually serves students so Mr. Itzen will cue the short video and then we'll hand off to Mr. Moskowitz. By working with various local advisory groups and national partners, the Long Beach Unified School District has developed the Learning Acceleration and Support Plan. The past year's experiences, along with community feedback and engagement, has led to a focus on four pillars for this plan. Academic acceleration and support, social emotional well-being, engagement and voice, and infrastructure and capital for the future. Exploring the document, you will find a message from Superintendent Dr. Jill Baker, followed by a plan overview page that will guide you to any components that you want more information on. Each pillar of the Learning Acceleration and Support Plan have dedicated color-coded sections that break down as such. An overview and description of the pillar, the pillar's goals, and the programs and supports that build each pillar. Each pillar's section of programs and supports will give you the title, goal, office lead, funding source, and cost estimate of each program or support. At the end of the document, you will find a glossary of terms that will help explain any acronyms you come across. As one of the leading school districts in urban education, the LBUSD community strives to support the personal and intellectual success of every student every day. The Learning Acceleration and Support Plan is our commitment to excellence and equity for all of our students. Visit lbschools.net forward slash L-A-S-P. As Brian begins his presentation, I, I do want to thank Chris Eftehue and our Public Information Office, his team, as well as Marketing and Media Services. You recognize that voice of Mr. Itzen, um, but Steve Swift was hard at work to produce the plan in, in the form that you see it in a very professional way. So thank you to those who have um, helped to professionalize the, the distribution of this plan. And I'll turn to Mr. Moskowitz. So as I was sitting um, yesterday through uh, you know, some great information through the first day of board workshop, I was um, making note, even though I knew much of what was going to be presented, I was making note of all of those ways 
that yesterday was really about creating the vision for where we're going next year. So you heard about the goals that we're setting for ourselves, superintendent, that will flow down to level offices and out to schools. You heard about how we're going to monitor student achievement and some of the ways that we're going to look differently at figuring out how our students are accelerating. You heard from the equity leadership team about ways we need to do things differently and kind of setting a vision for what that might look like. And so for me, my work in leading my team is how do we then realize this in a school down to the individual student level. It's one thing for us to have these goals, visions, and, and ideas. And but we need to get it down to the classroom level and down to the individual student level. And so today, I think you'll hear from each of uh, the three of us, myself, Dr. Lund, Dr. Camarino, what the, the realization of equity in schools will look like this next school year. So we could spend hours talking about all of the things we'll be doing. We don't have time for that. So what we thought we would do is really key in on a few key initiatives at each of our levels. So um, I'm going to be speaking specifically about two initiatives. One of them uh, that is um, unique to both, the, or I should say it's unique in both the elementary and K-8 schools. And another one that is actually an initiative in both elementary, K-8, and, or all three, elementary, K-8, and middle schools. So I'll be speaking initially on behalf of myself and Dr. Lund. So uh, one of the lines in the LASP is related to the instruction and intervention coordinator. And you can see there the goal is to accelerate student learning through coordination of all site interventions, progress monitoring, and ongoing collaborative planning with teachers to improve core instruction. And that's kind of that's kind of it right there. But I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about what that might look like in a school setting. And the way I'm going to do that is actually um, to, to, to walk you through some of the slides that we engaged in with our in, instruction and intervention coordinators last week. So we brought all of them together last week at Browning High School. I say we, and of course I, I'm part of a great team. So we had Dr. Demita Myers-Miller, Ms. Kim Weber, and Dr. Cecilia Camarino. We're the ones that were re really leading the efforts directly with them, and so I'm really speaking on, on our collective behalves. So when we were with them last week, one of the um, initial um, items that were discussed was, why are we doing this? What is the purpose for these IICs, as we call them? What is different than before? And so there was some conversation around, and there's some, a few bullet points here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I want to highlight the ones that I've bolded here. We recognize that we're returning from a year and a half of unprecedented interrupted learning. And we know that that looks different for every child. Some children were able to su succeed and flourish, and some were not. We can't assume anything about how it impacted students. We have to take each student individually and figure out where are they and where do we need to get them to go similar to what we heard from um, Chris Brown yesterday around that idea of individual goal setting for individual students to meet their individual needs. Third bullet, we also recognize that the way we're truly going to achieve equity for students is for every child to receive quality instruction in their classroom. That, that is equity, that every child receives high quality instructional practices from their teacher. So one of the, another key aspect of these IACs is to support the principal in ensuring that quality instruction that's happening in every classroom for every student. And that's, um, you know, again, we couldn't ask for more than that. But then ultimately, um, kind of down towards the bottom, something unique to the role of this IAC is in focusing teams, and that's really critical. They're not going to do this individually. Their role is to bring teams of teachers together, grade level teams, cross grade level teams, department teams, together to understand each student's needs, looking at data, analyzing data, acting on data, understanding the urgency of learning acceleration. Each student is going to have their own unique acceleration goal that we need to be able to meet. And then something that, that we've talked about in our district for a number of years now is around this idea of collective efficacy. And just in a nutshell, what that means is if we all work together, we all have a common understanding of what we expect for all of our students. All of our students belong to all of us. We all have a common understanding of what we're going to do to get there. And we work together to observe each other, give each other feedback as peers, and analyze that to make progress. Then we're going to achieve collective efficacy, and it is one of the greatest impacts on student achievement through multiple studies that we've been a part of um, in, in kind of exploring and reading about in, multiple, in the last several years. So in a nutshell, the role of the IEC is to work with these teams, look at data, ensure high quality instruction in every classroom, and then to determine what do students need to accelerate and how do we bring teams of teachers together uh, through this uh, idea of collective efficacy. So in our district, um, our principals, all of our schools, 
develop what we call a theory of action. You've probably heard reference to this in prior presentations. You'll hear it um, coming up after me as well. So the idea with a theory of action is it's kind of an if-then statement. If we do these things, then we expect this outcome. And it's not just kind of random. It's research-based practices. So in the case of the IACs, if the instruction and intervention coordinator, in collaboration with the principal, effectively leads teams to implement a PDSA framework, and I'll come back to that in a moment, with a focus on quality core instruction and strategic interventions, then teacher collective efficacy will increase and student learning will accelerate. So it's, it's, it's kind of a simple uh, sentence, but it's not necessarily simple to implement, right? So there's a lot of complexity to that. But I want to take you into this idea of the uh, PDSA, or more, uh, more fully called the Plan, Do, Study, Act cycle. And I believe yesterday, Ms. Kerr, you were kind of referencing the process that schools go through to look at data and act on data. That's not just enough to have the data, but what do you do with it? So in our district for many years now, going on 20 years, we've been implementing a, a um, cycle we, that we call the PDSA cycle. And the idea is that in this planning phase, you take the data that you have. It might be hard student data. It might be SEL data, survey data. It might be qualitative, observational data. It might be the needs of your teachers, that, that type of data. But you take the data you have in front of you, and based on that data, you put a plan in place that you think you're going to try to achieve. And then you implement that plan. You try it out. Now, oftentimes, you're not going to just do one thing. You're going to try a couple of different ways, because we don't know initially what's going to work. So we might try a couple of different initiatives that we think have the greatest success, and we're going to implement that and think of it as a pilot phase. We're going to implement it in a few classrooms and a different program in another one. And then we're going to study it. We're going to, along the way, not wait until the end of the year, but along the way, we're going to dipstick in and find out how are, are we making the progress we expected to make. And if we need to make a mid-course correction and act differently, we'll be prepared to do so. And ultimately, this PDSA cycle is repeating over the course of a week in a classroom, over the course of a month within a department or grade level, over the course of a quarter in a semester as a school is looking at their data, and then as a system, we're looking at these, these cycles of implementation as well. So um, again, kind of a, a simple explanation, but just know that there's a lot of uh, really deep hard work that goes into this idea of continuous improvement through a PDSA cycle. And our instruction and intervention coordinators, IICs as we're calling them, are going to be deeply engaged with the principal in this PDSA cycle and engaging teachers and teams of teachers, looking at their data, putting plans in place, analyzing along the way, and ensuring that it's re actually reaching the impact of the individual student level. And at the end of the day on Monday when they met last week, um, they came up with, they meaning the IACs, came up with some of their ideas around what is their mission and what is their vision. And so you can see, again, some of the bullets. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, pull up just, some of, again, some of the um, highlighted spots that came from our, our IACs, the teachers themselves that it's about collective responsibility. It's not about individual teachers accomplishing this in their classroom, but collectively doing so. It's about creating equitable academic experiences. So what happens in a school on the west side should be happening in a school on the east side. The quality of instruction in North Long Beach should be the quality of instruction in downtown Long Beach. And so that, that came from their voice. That it's about creating systemic change. It's not about implementing great things in one place but where it's working and where we're seeing through the PDSA cycle that we're seeing success, we're going to replicate that. And we're going to be bringing the IECs together regularly to say what's working at your site, how might we expand that thinking out to other sites? So the, the collective efficacy even within the IECs as a team, a, a professional learning community, community, if you will. To cultivate a shared responsibility for the learning of every student every day. And then, uh, again, with collective efficacy, this idea down the vision, to empower the people you work with to teach, grow, and learn, and to be the, be the best versions of themselves. So when we think about equity, and again, we use that term a lot, but what about the equity for individual teachers? How do we ensure that we're providing to the individual teacher what they need to be the best they can be? The professional learning and support that teachers need is not all the same, just like the instruction and support that students need is not all the same. So from their own words, how do we empower those we work with to be the best versions of themselves? And that's pretty awesome as well. So let me pause there before I move into the second initiative I want to discuss and see if you have any questions just about the IIC position. Just a general question, uh, uh, Brian. What, um, can you highlight a couple things that 
are new in terms of this approach um, and or different uh, from what IICs were doing or have been doing before? Yeah, so the, the short answer is there has not been an IIC before okay. this year. Okay. So that's the short answer. Okay. The, the reality is this work. That was easy. Yeah. The reality <laughs> is this work fell completely generally on the, sh the shoulders of the principal to lead this. The principal is not absolved of this. In fact, the principal is still the key instructional leader at the school. The principal will be integrally involved in everything that the IEC is doing. Okay. The difference is now we have a teacher leader on site to come alongside the principal and to be out working with peers, not from an evaluative standpoint, but from a coaching support and bringing us together standpoint. And we think that's really a, a critical nuance that will um, be nice to bring into this year. Perfect, thank you. Yep. And so what will that look like, let's say, at an elementary school? What does that look like? Do they meet once a month? That type of thing. Yeah, so that's, um, it, it is going to vary by site. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to talk about our literacy program and the literacy teachers in our schools. Uh, the reality is, again, the needs of our schools are not the same. So we have a, a smaller school on the east side, Emerson, as an example. They're going to have one position, and that one position will be a part-time IIC and a part-time literacy teacher. On the other side of the district at Dooley Elementary School, we're gonna have an IAC that will have five or six literacy teachers that they'll be supporting. So the roles and the, the implementation is gonna look very different at, across our sites based on the needs of the students at our sites. So we didn't deploy this support um, equally across. We, we're doing it in a way that is really about the needs of the students at these sites. So at an, at an Emerson, it might be uh, once a month, the IAC is working with a third grade team. Whereas at Dooley, it might be once a week that they're able to work with a grade level team. So it will look different, and that's part of what we'll be working with our principals on and how they will support the different deployment based on the needs of their site. Yeah, is, is this funded by one-time money, or is it going to be sustainable, and how are we going to do that? What, what, what's the thinking about that? Yeah, thank you. And um, Ms. Takashi, if you would mind, I know we, on the first page related to the, um, the plan itself, the LASP plan, we're calling it the ELO, and I forgot the, the term there. Yeah, the ex you're talking about the first, the uh, expanded learning opportunities. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So, so, Mr. Otto, that particular item is funded out of short term money, one time money. Um, our work will be to evaluate the different programs that we use over the next several years to determine if there's a, if there's a way to, mm -hmm. if we want to continue them, continue them, mm -hmm. how we might fund them. And so many of these will be, this one in particular will be studied by our, someone in the research office to determine its, its efficacy. And if it's something that has a um, positive impact on students, then we'll be looking for either mm -hmm. how do we continue to, to or how do we um, stop doing something that isn't as effective and continue this. Got it. Well, one time money is still money. Yes, okay. yes. Okay, so let me move on then to the idea of the, our, our next initiative at the elementary level, the elementary literacy program. Um, similar to what I said before, um, any number of people could be standing up here speaking to this. In fact, the, the heavy lift of leading uh, this particular initiative is actually living in OCIPD. Um, through the support of Director Tammy Lavelle and Program Administrator Lisa Worsham under Dr. Kale's supervision. So I'm speaking to it because there is a, a great deal of collaboration between our offices and the part I'm speaking to is really the work that we did in the elementary office leading up to the summer where we handed off to OCIP to really carry the ball from here. So the elementary literacy program is also in our LASP, the, the plan, talks about the uh, literacy intervention and the narrative says provide research-based consistent literacy interventions across all sites through the allocation and ongoing training of literacy teachers and the purchase of intervention materials. And if you look over on that right-hand column, that's not a small number, right? We're looking at over $21 million in funding. So if we're gonna spend $21 million, we need to make sure we're doing it. And right? Mr. Moskowitz, may I comment to yes, just please. Mr. Otto, follow up to your question. So this is a great example of a multi-funded initiative LCFF is ongoing funds combined to it, it really accelerate this program with, again, the Expanded Learning Opportunities Grant. Mm -hmm. um, so braided funding, as we often call it. Thank you, Dr. Baker. So in many ways, the, the literacy teachers and literacy program that we're working into next year is really a repurposing of something that has been in our system for a number of years. We have been funding literacy classes in our district at the elementary level for a number of years. 
Um, we we, we, we um, value that we're a continuous improvement district. We look at our own data, and sometimes we have to make the hard decisions and, and be really clear with ourselves that something we're doing isn't working the way we want it to work or to the best of what we think is best for students. And so this is a great example. Um, the previous model of literacy was that we would have 20 students in one classroom. Um, sometimes you can think of them as the lowest performing students within a grade level. Not always the lowest, but a, a group of lower performing students, 20 of them in a classroom at many of our Title I schools. And then our other classrooms within that grade level might be at 27, 28, up to 30 uh, students in the classroom. So that was the model that we implemented. Th there is value sometimes in really being in be able to hone in on what the students, um, hone the skills of the students in that classroom. But the reality is that there was at times inconsistent implementation of practices across our district. And as we looked at data, first with um, Dr. Lund um, and a, a research um, fellow, or actually somebody completing their uh, doctoral program, looked at some research on our behalf, and we realized a couple of years ago that the, the students in our literacy classes, oftentimes the lower performing students, were growing, and you heard um, Chris yesterday talk about acceleration, their growth was actually slower in many cases, in most cases, than the growth of students that were not in literacy classes. And we're trying to accelerate these students up to grade level, and we were actually seeing that sometimes their growth was slower than their non-literacy peers. So the data was telling us that it wasn't working the way we had hoped it would work. So we needed to figure out a new way to meet the needs of our students. Um, so that, in addition to anticipating that there are going to be increased, potentially increased literacy needs in our students this next year and in the coming years, uh, we made the decision to, to make this shift. This timeline is really important because we can't, as you can imagine, you, you don't just um, snap your fingers and change something that's been in your system for a number of years. And so it required a lot of collaboration with our labor partners, a lot of collaboration with teachers, principals, district staff. So back in November and December, um, we started a process of researching, if we're not going to do it the way we've done it, how might we do it differently? And we worked with OCIPD and principals, a focus group, to really think about what are some other options that could be viable. And we worked with the budget office to think about how might we allocate positions differently, more equitably, and what might that look like across our system. Then in January and February, I first met, um, spoke with Mr. Calopy, and then I met with the um, TAL negotiations team to share with all of them our thinking and receive some great feedback from them. Um, based on that feedback, we talked about a webinar that I was going to present, and we did present a webinar for all elementary teachers who were interested in participating in January, gave them an opportunity to give us some input, ask questions that we were able to answer live right there in the moment. And based on that feedback and the other work we've done, we finalized our plans and presented to principals in February. From there, principals were able to go and share um, the plans with their teachers at their sites. And we were able to share um, kind of the dispositions of a literacy teacher that we would be looking for, the expectations, if you will. And from that, principals then asked for volunteers. Who might be interested from our site? Who might be interested in taking on this work? Um, and in almost uh, every case, those who opted in, asked to do the work, were the ones that were selected to do the work. Uh, the principals made their selections, but again, in almost every case, it was the, the teachers who said they wanted, they felt really um, excited to be able to take on this new challenge. So then May through August, it's a matter of purchasing materials, and I'll get to the materials in a moment. Um, again, talking about selecting the program leaders, so Ms. Lavelle was promoted to the director position. Uh, Ms. Worsham was brought into OCIPD as a program administrator. From there, over the last couple of months, has really been the handoff because there, there is a strong curriculum aspect to this. Um, and, and that's kind of where we're at at this point. Last week, all of our literacy teachers were trained over a three-day training, and they are now preparing to gear up to, to implement uh, the literacy program at the start of the school year. So let's talk then a little bit about the, the program specifically, what it is and what, what it isn't. These are direct services to students. So what this is not, this is not what you may have heard in the past of a TOSA, a teacher on special assignment, who's kind of pseudo-administrative in the office with the principal. These are teachers who are in the classroom with students. That is their role. They're also working with their, their um, peers and in, in their teachers in the rooms that they're going into, but it is direct services to students. That we're going to be providing the training and support to ensure that it's consistent implementation. That was one of the, the flaw, uh, flaws we saw in our prior program 
This will be a more consistent implementation of programs across our schools. And while it won't be the 20 students in one class that created that class size reduction, we're going to increase the ratios and in many cases have two teachers in a room for parts of every day. So that while the classroom teacher is working with a small group of students in one area, the literacy teacher is working with a small group of students in another. That you can think of it as kind of high dose tutoring, that really intentional intervention in the classroom with two um, trained teachers working at the same time. Something else that I think is really critical for, for your just knowledge and consideration is that we understand that um, this kind of an intervention, this kind of a literacy support is really built on the foundation of that quality instruction in every classroom. So we don't just go in and say, okay, who are the kids that need help? That's not really the idea. The idea is let's work together to provide a really high quality literacy program, reading, writing, all the speaking and listening skills. So all of those standards are being implemented with highly effective ways with our IAC supporting that with all classroom teachers. Then when we're finding that there are some students who need more, now we're able to use our literacy teachers to provide that little bit of more that students may need. But it is, it is built on this idea of quality tier one instruction, high quality instruction in every classroom. When we know students need more based on data, then we're prepared now with this literacy program to provide that support. So a couple of the programs that we looked at, um, as I said, in, in our district, we pride ourselves on not just kind of going wholesale into any one thing, we continuous improvement. So what we did was in looking at the research, we narrowed down to two programs that we wanted to implement. And you might ask why, why two and why not just use one? Well, one of the things we want to do is we want to study the efficacy of these two programs. Both of them, frankly, we're, we're very confident that both of these are going to be really good for kids and that students are going to accelerate um, with teachers that are trained in either program. And in fact, many of the skills that teachers are being trained on, looking at data, implementing data, high quality language arts programs are going to be the same across both. But the other thing we want to do is we want to see, is there a program that actually is more effective than the other? And we'll be prepared in a year or two if we're finding that one is more effective than the other to potentially move all of our schools to implementing the more effective program. But we didn't want to replicate what we did last time, implementing something across every site and then having to wait eight years to say, actually, let's do something different. We want to know in a year or two, is there one way that might be more effective than another and we'll be prepared to move that way. But the two programs, one is WonderWorks, which is directly aligned to our core curriculum of wonders at the elementary level. And the other is Fountas and Pinnell uh, Leveled Literacy Intervention, which has a lot of foundation in our district around Reader's Writers Workshop, the work that's happening in our reading recovery program. Many of our schools are already implementing LLI as a kind of an intervention at the site level. And then last, I'll leave you, unless you have some questions, I'll leave you with this idea of what, are we, what is it we're looking for in our literacy teachers? And again, I won't read all of these things, but something we want is we want a teachers who really have a strong foundation of quality tier one instruction. They're gonna be a resource for the classroom teacher in which they push into. They need to understand all of the components of that idea of a comprehensive ballot. It's not just about reading, it's not just about writing. It's about a comprehensive approach to literacy and understanding diagnostically what kids need in order to move to higher levels. That they have a strong desire for continued learning to support oneself and others, this idea of continuous improvement and collective efficacy. And that we're gonna continually look at data, uh, look at the resources available in our, in our programs and really look at the individual students to be able to implement it to the highest, our highest capacity. So we have a couple questions about the literacy program. Um, otherwise, I'll hand it off to Dr. Lund. Mr. Otto, did you have a question? Any questions, colleagues? Thank you, Mr. Moskowitz. Right, thank Excellent. You. Good morning again. I'm excited to uh, share our plan for our restorative, restorative justice initiative at the middle school level. This is a $2.2 million initiative it is a braided funded initiative uh, out of both LCAP and ESSER funds. And it is a multi-year initiative. So um, as with any strategic plan, uh, you really have to think about it long-term. We're looking at 22 schools impacting a thousand classrooms and really being strategic over a, a three to five year plan of what this is gonna look like uh, in terms of implementation. And it is a multi-pronged approach. So I'll, I'll kind of go through what that looks like. 
Our theory of action, as, you, as Brian uh, alluded to, um, is really based upon the prior work that we've done with our administrators around building a common understanding of restorative practices. It's uh, pred predicated upon engaging teachers, uh, at first those that are really w excited to really engage in this work, to shift culture. Um, the end goal is not to just implement restorative practices. The end goal is really shifting the culture in both classrooms and schools to be more restorative. And then obviously an output of that is really decreasing our historically high suspension rate at the middle school level. Um, so in our training last week with Principal Cafele, he talked about you don't do equity. It is really a way of being. I would say restorative work is also the same. There are restorative practices that we train teachers on, but there's also a way of being restorative. And I think that's really important to keep in mind in terms of how you create restorative teachers and restorative leaders in this work. There is a foundation here over the past two years uh, built upon the work that Dr. Camarino has started at the middle school level. Uh, lifting up the practices that CCEJ has trained our administrators on. And you see uh, some of those uh, specific trainings that we've conducted with our principals, assistant principals, and our counselors at this level to really build their understanding of what this looks like. The second is uh, relying on certain literature that we've purchased for all of our administrators. And then we did run a principal quit this past year, which is a quality improvement team around restorative practices to really support our principals in this, uh, in shifting their mindsets around this work and really building up the excitement uh, around implementation of this work. So there are certain practices that we've defined as uh, to help teachers in terms of implementing uh, restorative work. So you see there are certain circle processes um, that has a long history uh, in terms of why a circle uh, in terms of doing this work. There is community building activities that teachers can engage with uh, to, to really build community in their classrooms. There is a shift in the language that you use in the classroom around restorative dialogue. There is obviously responding to specific uh, you know, problems uh, that occur in classrooms and how you respond to those problems. How do you restore relationships when harm has occurred? And then how do you help students re-enter the classroom when there has been some kind of infraction? And obviously we're relying on our partnership with CC, uh, CCJ to build this work. We have some capacity as it relates to the budget that we've allocated. We have an RJ administrator position. Laura Martin was in that position. Obviously she has transitioned now into the principal of our independent study school. So we are in the process of hiring a new administrator for that position. This is a shared position for this coming year, a shared position of a traditional AP role at Stanford Middle School with this uh, administra RJ administrator role to help kind of guide uh, our launch of this initiative. We've allocated funds for four restorative justice coaches. We've hired two at this point. Uh, and then we also have a strong partnership with our Office of School Support Services and Amy Love, who is uh, our SEL lead at the middle school level, uh, who's done extensive work within restorative practices. There is a strong connection between SEL work and restorative work. So we really want to help teachers see that connection and really draw upon the excellent expertise that Amy Love brings to that role. We have allocated significant funds to support school sites that are willing to engage in initial training with CCJ. And I'd say that's really the, the onset of this work is that training that occurs with teachers to build their understanding of this. The second piece is really relying then on our coaches to really deepen the practice. So you help teachers build understanding of this work, and then you use coaching to help deepen that practice uh, with them, which includes modeling, but it also includes sort of co-teaching or co-leading some of these practices, and then really strategic feedback based on those practices. You see here our strategic plan around that work. So it's really predicated upon an effective professional development model that talks about really building understanding first with teachers, opportunities to model those practices and practice uh, those instructional practices. And then finally, what we call transfer learning into really deepening that work, deepening those practices. You see it's uh, really built 
upon really a, a four-year plan that we've built out at this point. The, the first part of that plan is really working with those interested sites around voluntary training. So there's two approaches here. You can go into a school site and you can require this training for everyone. The second approach is you go into the school and you work with those teachers that are really excited about implementation of this work, building capacity. We want to be really sensitive to not create resistance to this work. This is not um, a replacement of our safe and civil practices. It's what we frame this as is these are bookends to what an effective community looks like in a classroom. There are safe and civil practices combined with restorative practices to really assure a strong community of learners within a classroom. There's work that obviously needs to occur with teachers that want to deepen this work through coaching, work that needs to occur with administrators to continue to deepen their understanding, uh, and then obviously working with our teams uh, on a larger scale to really talk about the school-wide culture. We don't want students living in a restorative classroom, but then exiting that classroom into a non-restorative school. So we wanna make sure we're working on both tiers at the same time so that we're shifting the classroom at the same time we're shifting the school site. The obviously deepening the work through additional coaching and training for uh, year two of this work, and then really working on the school-wide implementations for year three and four. Here's a snapshot of the level of interest across our school sites. So really talking about that voluntary nature of how many teachers do we have interested in this work? This is, um, so we had roughly 65% of our teachers that were interested in restorative practices. So we're starting in a good place where we have a high level of interest amongst our middle school teachers. The schools that are highlighted there on the far right are you see the number of teachers in each of those schools that expressed uh, explicit interest in, in uh, initial training in this work. The far left, you can see the highlighted schools that already have a good number of teachers that have already been trained. So we have 176 teachers that have already been trained in, uh, through CCJ, an additional 279 that have expressed interest in that training. So obviously the principals in these sites on the far right there will be our targeted sites in terms of building out additional training for this school site, many of which have already set up training. So the, in our initial survey of our principals, which you see on the next slide here, we have roughly 37% uh, that, that had already set up contracts with CCJ. This was back in June. We have three or four new contracts that are pending, so we're probably looking at about 50% right now, and that will continue to expand. On the right-hand side there, you see 96% of, of our site principals expressed interest in pursuing additional training for this year. So uh, all that being said is to say that there's a, a groundswell of interest and support for this initiative, which is very encouraging. From a coaching standpoint, so for our two coaches that have been hired so far and for the two pending coaches, it will be working at these strategic sites where there are teachers that have already expressed interest in receiving coaching. So you see a large number of teachers there on the far right at these sites that said that they are interested in coaching right now. So this gives us uh, a really easy pathway into that coaching relationship and that outreach to those specific sites. You see a large number at select sites and those will probably be our targeted sites to really initiate this work. Finally, uh, we have some additional training that we're doing with administrators this summer. So that training is actually uh, occurring next week. Uh, around really the higher level CCJ training around uh, harm and conflict. So this is a way to deepen the practice with our administrators. Uh, and then obviously the work around integrating safe and civil practices with restorative practices and what does that look like will be part of our professional development that we engage in with principals throughout this school year. All right, what questions can I answer for you regarding our restorative justice implementation plan? I have more of a comment than a question, really. Um, it's not lost on me that our, our half-time administrator for RJ is going to be positioned at Stanford because that person will be working with Suzanne Caverly, who <clears throat> is a huge advocate for RJ, and she's had so much success with her time at, at Beach and, and now at Stanford. So. Um, I think that was uh, 
most likely intentional placement. And so I thank you for doing that. Yeah, uh, Ms. Caverly has been uh, obviously uh, an advocate for this work, uh, as well as a leader in, amongst our team in relation to this work. So she'll be able to obviously mentor our new administrator coming into this role, as well as then support uh, this person in terms of supporting the coaching with the work. So some of that coaching will obviously occur at Stanford with teachers that were, had expressed interest in that work. Uh, and sh like I said, being a thought partner around that implementation. We really want to make sure this initiative is successful. So we really are taking a sort of a go slow to go fast sort of approach to this work to make sure that we're intentional, cautious, supportive, each stage of this implementation. Yeah, um, and thank you for that. I, I so appreciate the system work that you just talked about. This is an incredibly precise and well thought out plan. We know change doesn't happen overnight and you have outlined year one, year two, year three, so we can see where it's going. So I appreciate the acknowledgement um, and the specific planning around a systems approach to this. I think in the past we've often looked at this as an intervention for certain schools and certain communities and the reality is that restorative practices and a restorative mindset benefit all of our students in every classroom across the district. And so that we're taking this from something we tried in certain places in response potentially to things that were happening that, that we're seeing that overall, I think that's a, a huge sign of learning on our part that we know that this is best for every student. So I wanna thank you for um, the really clear plan and presentation around expectation and even having, you know, the numbers of who's interested and who's not, that's not a judgment chart at all because we knew if everybody said yes, we couldn't do it that way anyway. So what it does is it helps us lead the work in that really intentional way with people who um, at this time are um, ready and excited to work and to do the work and learning and implementation. So um, thank you for continuing to work with our partners on this and for a really clear system approach. Yeah, there's enormous power in word of mouth amongst teachers. So as you build capacity in certain classrooms, teachers talk to other teachers about this work. Um, and when they start seeing benefits in terms of the culture that they've built in those classrooms, uh, that becomes contagious with other teachers, uh, which hopefully then will expand the interest uh, and the implementation of this work. Dr. Lund, um, I, I wanna sort of see if you can expand on this um, sort of great philosophical approach that it doesn't make any sense if you're in a restorative classroom, you step out of that classroom and you're not in a restorative school and or a restorative district. So um, just to, to, to build on board member Kerr's question, I'm excited that so many teachers are enthusiastic and open. I'm wondering um, what your sense is of those teachers that may not yet be ready or as is interested, if it's around hesit hesitancy of the approach if there's a perception that there's not an alignment with our safe and civil uh, practices, um, if it's seen as like an additional, I have to go through this additional training, what is your sense sort of di district-wide? Yeah, I, I appreciate the question. Um, I would say that we were coming off of a very difficult year this past year. So this survey was done in June. Um, knowing where we had come from and just the willingness to take on a new initiative at this point. So I think part of it might just be a reflection of where people were at the time we surveyed them. Surveyed them. Two, might just be an awareness of the program itself. So we had an enormous response from Hughes, for example. Troy Bennett had done some really good groundwork with his team around really understanding what restorative practices were and interest in restorative work. Uh, so much so that Hughes, uh, like Nelson, actually hired their own on-site TOSA to really help lead the coaching work at the site. So I think part of it also is just how we build awareness of the program. So as different schools are at different places in that trajectory. So it could be also just a reflection of the, of the prior conversations that had occurred with staff. And that was my assumption, but I think there is going to be a, a positive buzz, all right, once this work starts getting more uh, traction and I think also relying on our ambassadors, yes, uh, right, that have already been deep into the work. So uh, thank you, Dr. Lund. You're welcome. All right, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Camarino and the High School Student Success Initiative. 
Thank you, Dr. Lund. So I move forward here. Thank you. Uh, really excited to come and present our support of our Student Success Initiative with our team behind uh, me to really show and demonstrate uh, really the responsibility of really helping uh, our underrepresented students have success in high school. And it's a daunting task in knowing that, you know, with uh, Chris Brown and Pete Davis in the past when they were leading the high school office, secondary office, and looking at the data that we had, uh, and looking at the work that's been done in the past and really br bridging pieces together in the work that we've started at the high school level. A little bit of the why the Student Success Initiative and prior to the pandemic, as you can see here with the data, uh, in 2019, we had Alt-Ed referrals for African American students were about 20, almost 20 and a half percent, whereas they only make up 11 percent of the district population. Uh, you see the Latinx students, 76.89% uh, referrals for Alt-Ed when they only represent 59% of the district and so on. So you see the data there as to the why. And if you look at the, the next slide, that in 2019, 437 referrals to Alt-Ed or all-male students. The percentage of African-American, Latinx, and Pacific Islander to Alt-Ed exceed the district demographic. So in the post-pandemic, obviously, the why for a student success initiative is the incoming ninth graders, the, the high amounts of DF, right, the DNFs that our students are receiving in middle school, um, the incoming social needs, uh, social emotional needs that our stu students are going to have, and obviously looking at equity based and providing supports for our students. In the next slide, uh, what, what we talk about with Student Success Initiative is to have a multi level intervention program for supports with students with significant risk factors pointing them out, right, and knowing that as we leave middle school, we know some of our students who we know are going to need more support um, and providing them supports with, desi with, with the designated uh, needs for targeted students in mind and addressing uh, uh, behavioral, academic, and social emotional needs of our students. So we did a lot of work with our middle school office uh, and working with Nora. We want to thank her, the counselor over our middle schools, and really targeting and looking at all of our eighth grade students throughout our system to really find where, where the students are that needed the most supports. So in that, I would just want to introduce our team behind me. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Margo Atkins Jackson, who is going to be our uh, SSI Student Success Initiative Admin Math Collaborative. Would you uh, please stand? Yeah, please. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Dr. Jackson. Thank you. I can see behind, thank you, Dr. Baker. Uh, Cliff Parks and Alex Chavez will be our We Rise supervisors who you've known have done a lot of work with our students and doing uh, family visits and working with students in, uh, in, in sometimes individually in small groups. And Dr. Kimberly Johnson, who's gonna be, uh, as you know, the great work she's done with Leadership Academy, Female Leadership Academy, and helping both our male and female academies at our high schools to be consistent in their practices and the work and the support that we're going to do. Uh, that's all the above the line district support that we're going to have. Uh, obviously, also Mr. Ed Samuels, who's back here too. I know he doesn't want a lot of the. In, in, he got a lot of uh, uh, great work yesterday done with our independent studies uh, and the work that he's doing there. But also Mr. Ed Samuels working together. Uh, our sites will have individual site supports with a COSA or a counselor on special assignment. Uh, that, that'll have, uh, that'll be over the math collaborative, the male and female uh, leadership academy teacher, uh, and then also the We Rise with our formerly known as deans, now we're going to call intervention support. Because as we know, a lot of our, our deans at our high schools typically worked in that reactive support uh, in, the, in our schools where if something happened, they went in to talk with their, so we want our deans and now intervention specialists to actually do proactive work and getting to know the students and welcoming them. So I'll get into more detail of what their work will be. And we'll have the TOSAs that'll support the work that we have with our students on the site. So our programs really comprise of, uh, our student success initiative is comprised of three programs. We Rise, Math Collaborative, and Leadership Academies. Uh, you are familiar with uh, Math Collaborative as we have it at Jordan and at uh, Cabrillo and at Wilson High School. So you've seen some of that work there too. And Leadership Academies you're fairly familiar with, with female and male academies that we have throughout our system, K through 12, with, with some of the work that we're there that we have there. So now we have We Rise. So We Rise, and the purpose of the We Rise is to improve the graduation rate of our underrepresented students. Again, as we talked about, working cl uh, collectively with Cliff and Alex, who worked with um, um, Michael Gray in developing curriculum, but also to connecting with, Laura, with Nora from the middle school office to find our students that have the most intense support, that, that whether they were academic, behavior or attendance issues that we've known our students have needed support with. Uh, students who have been disconnected with schools traditionally and having them have a soft landing as they come to our school. So the We Rise program targets our incoming freshmen. 
So we're looking at our 35 most wanting of male and female students to put them together in groups to have supports together with our COSAs and our TOSAs. Uh, our, our teachers on special assignment, not only just in math but in ELA, are going to provide that support that those students need to make those connections. But more than anything else, as Cliff and Alex have had an opportunity to do this summer, is to go to do uh, site visits, home visits with the students and the families to get to know them so they know that there's someone that they can already reach as they come onto our high school campuses and we support the students as we come there. So again, We Rise is focused on our ninth grade incoming students at all of our high schools. So this is the great opportunity that we're gonna be able to provide for all of our students at all of our high school as, we, they, as they welcome our freshmen, especially even this week. We're doing orientation and um, link crew this week with our students. Dr. Camarino, can yes. you share just specifically to the We Rise curriculum what that means for a student during yeah. the week? Does that mean they're going through a class? Does that mean just thank be really you. specific? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, we narrowed down, we had a larger uh, sl uh, um, slide deck to share, but yes, our students will now have an extra class. So t traditionally our students are given uh, seven, six to seven classes depending upon what their pathway program provides. So now in their unscheduled period or unscheduled periods, they will have a class where they will come together uh, and with male students and or female students coming together uh, during their unscheduled period to have curriculum that Michael Gray helped develop along with Cliff and Alex and uh, the work with Carol Ortega and putting together some work where there's a lot of empowerment, enrichment work, uh, motivation, identity, um, and so they'll have that time to work together during their, uh, during their classes that are unscheduled. For those students that don't have that particular class time off, we will connect with them at another time, whether it's, you know, most the class may be at second period at Lakewood. If a student doesn't have that second period open, we will work with them on their other unscheduled period in a more differentiated way to provide those supports. More importantly, it's all about relationships and building that connection with our freshman students as they come in. Thank you, Dr. Baker, for clarifying that. Oops. Just a quick question. Did you say, um, like the leadership classes, they would be segregated by gender? Yes, they will be. Okay. Yes, for supports. Um, sorry, I'm going to the wrong buttons. Okay. Uh, for Math Collaborative, uh, you're very familiar with, we again, through the work that we've done at Jordan High School uh, and the work that uh, uh, Michael Crowder Jones, who was at Wilson, and um, um, uh, uh, Terrence Austin, who's at Cabrillo, we will now branch out and have that math collaborative support at all of our high schools again um, to support them in the work that we're doing to bring our students together to have a quality STEM education and get them ready for college and career. Um, as you see some of the requirements that we have, uh, as we've worked with Terrence before, we set the standard and, and, and put this guide out for our parents and students to know that Math Collaborative provides support for students and uh, with GPAs of 2.0 or higher, but we have also taken students with lower GPAs. We set that as kind of a threshold or standard because we've found that students that typically are, uh, if they have a lower than a 2.0 GPA, we give them other supports with our COSAs and TOSAs that aren't necessarily in the program, but we definitely will put them into the Math Collaborative as they work their way into the supports that we're gonna provide. And I'll go into some of those details of the supports in, in one quick second. And then obviously our student leadership academies, uh, we've done a lot of work together as you all know from the male and female academies that we've had at all our different levels from elementary, middle and high school. Uh, Dr. Johnson will be able to again lead our work to really have that tier of support and kind of mentors for our students and we hope that this works in a way where we are we wise students or our freshmen who are struggling may work themselves into being a part of the math collaborative group but also be a part of male or female academy so that there's a ongoing support as we go through in the subsequent years these we rise students in ninth grade become mentors for the we rise students that come into ninth grade the following year so again these students will follow us from ninth through twelfth grade and be a part of this mentorship group where they're all going to be involved in either math collaborative or male and female academies so there's kind of a bridge of hoping that they get out of that uh, most wanting situation that they're in now from being in We Rise into being student leaders through male and female academies. So it's going to be a feeder pattern of just looking at the work that we do together that we build and build leaders with the group that start with the We Rise students as their freshman year to, to these other leaders that they're going to hope to aspire to. So some of the supports that we will provide is after school and Saturday tutoring. And again, thank you to Dr. Baker, the team, to giving us the supports to be able to have. Again, as we know, the, the key pieces those, those are those connections with students. And looking at what we've done in Math Collaborative, what we've done with Male and Female Academy. Again, not reinventing something or inventing something new, but really using the strengths of past programs that we've had in the district that we know have been successful for our students to provide that tutoring. And that tutoring also comes with counseling after school and on Saturdays 
but not just for students, but also for parents. And that's gonna be a real huge piece. We're doing a lot of work, and thank you to uh, Dr. Atkins Jackson, uh, Cliff and Alex, for the work that they're doing and really helping our COSAs and TOSAs get trained in using resources, whether it's an Elroy, how to do a proper home visit, the aspects of doing that, because I know all these site folks that are in charge of Student Success Initiative may not have that experience of being able to know how to go on a home visit, the safest way, the approach, the, uh, the different techniques of being able to be effective, not just with families and, and students at, at the site, but at the, at the home level too. With that also comes, we hope to give all three of our programs uh, college visits, uh, have community partners. I know we have a lot of folks in the community that wanna help our students, and we wanna give them mentors, be able to bring them over to have assemblies. So really a different experience for our students to really have the connection to not just be in the routine as we all know, go to school, motivate them, and give them tutoring, but also bring in other outside folks that, are, you know, that we know wanna help our students and give them mentorship, opportunities to go out and see them on the job, see what's going on, the work that we've done with the port uh, and, and, every, and other, avid, other uh, businesses that I know are willing to take on a lot of our students to give them opportunities to see something different outside of school and what the future brings for them in college and career work. So our next step, steps, uh, the, you'll see that that's a hyperlink to look at where our staff is and how many staff have been there. Uh, again, thank you to the team behind me. They have been working so hard since this all initiated and being able to, as you know, you talked to Dr. Lund who just left for his interviews, as all this has gone on, there's been a lot of opportunities for, uh, for different promotions or different leadership opportunities. So we're still staffing our team as, we, as we're working now. Uh, we're gonna give a lot of opportunities to again, have our own student leaders or student tutors to help out, even help, helping that, help having that peer uh, mentoring, peer support for our students. So the student tutors are another exciting piece of being able to bring in whether it's during the school day, uh, after school, or even on Saturdays. Uh, materials and resources, we're gonna provide site specific as I, our principals are doing a great job of giving our, our site uh, leadership teams uh, a rooms to access, to have office spaces, to be able to meet with parents throughout the day because we know parents will be able to come in, uh, giving access to the school uh, on Saturdays and after school. So we've done a lot of work with our sites already to be able to work around having these, uh, this work. We're still, uh, again, staffing with site coordinators, intervention specialists, and site teams, and then having it, we're gonna have an advisory group uh, with our an ethnic studies support also to be able to um, we have that Saturday ethnic studies program at all our high schools also since we're going to have our school open on Saturdays is also provide support to those students as they take on a college course with ethnic studies to have a higher success rate of students completing that course and, and and passing with you know grades that we want them to have on their transcripts as they move into applying to universities so uh, I, oh, I know you might have specific questions and, uh, and then that's why the team is here to answer some of those questions that you might have about our Student Success Initiative. So let me do this in the interest of time. Let's um, go one quick round if we have one question and or comment. You wanna start a sophomore number? And cram it all into one question? <laughs> I'll start over there. A any thoughts or questions over here? Okay. Can you get your mic, Doug? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's no, no real questions. I'll, I'll follow up afterwards. Thank you. Diana? You know, I know this is a huge, um, a huge effort. I, I love the fact that we have so many um, different supports in place and that we are acknowledging the challenge, not just for our students, but for the teachers in this last year and a half and that we're coming at it with, with everything we have. I know that we've enjoyed success with our um, math collaborative, with the male and female leadership academies, and I also appreciate the fact that we are calling on students as um, peer mentors, and I know that we've seen success when we, when we put the, I, I guess not really the, um, or, or give them the responsibility, but they rise to the, the occasion. The, the students do so well. I've seen it over and over again with um, Dr. Baker's um, group, the uh, student advisory um, group. When, when we allow our students to do work or to have the responsibilities of, say, some of the adults, it's a it's both a teaching and a learning experience. And I appreciate the fact that we truly value our students. 
we support them and we give them an opportunity to grow. So thank you for all the work being done. Um, but I don't think I have any questions. That's okay. Uh, I'm sure our board member Claire does. I don't, actually, oh. just a quick comment. And it, I'm sensing a theme over the last day and a half, and especially today. I really appreciate the critical look at our current practices, um, examining things through data, figuring out what has worked the best of some of our good programs. And, and this just demonstrates for me that we're looking at those best, best practices within those programs that we know have been successful. Because we know that when some of these programs started either 8, 10, 12 years ago, they were best practices then and the students of 2021 are different than the students at the time. So that we're willing to look at what we've done and say this has worked well, we're going to let this particular practice slide. And I think the other piece of that is some of those things that were innovative when these programs began 10 or 12 years ago are best practice for every student now. And so that we're critically looking at how to we drill down to provide even more specific support to support students in 2021 is really um, a testament to our willing to be self-critical. So thank you for that. Yes, uh, Dr. Camarino, I'm, I'm, so I'm really interested um, in the systems uh, piece and, and, and how you started off sort of framing that, you know, at the end of the day, 2019 data shows that we have a disproportionate number of uh, Latino and black male students um, you know, being referred to all ed mm -hmm. uh, here. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you can give us sort of the weave of this, this sort of three-pronged approach uh, of how that will ultimately address the bigger systems piece, right? So can you speak to the conditions and or the criteria uh, that lead to a disproportionate number of our male students of color, uh, you know, going down not necessarily the best path pathway or, or pipeline uh, and I know that that's a big question but given the restorative work uh, that Dr. Lund just covered given uh, the, the base sort of starting off from kindergarten th through fifth that uh, Mr. Moskovitz covered at the end of the day by the time they get to you Dr. Camarino uh, you know th there have been potentially multiple interventions mm -hmm. supports services so how do we address that, uh, right, if, if, if still in that ninth grade, um, we're, we're, we're uh, you know, the challenge uh, with that, Jay. Yeah, I appreciate the question. So we've worked with uh, Chris Brown even as soon as, as late as yesterday, the day before when we met together about even just Pulse data, right, of ensuring that our students get a voice and be able to, to be able to capture, because we can try to remedy and feel like we're gonna hit these intervention pieces that we think are really critical and important, mentors and field trips and, and supports after school and Saturdays, but if we're not listening to the students and to listen to their stories as to why they're struggling still and the many ways that we have to be sensitive to what their stories are and to meet those needs, that's the, the piece that's really gonna be the most critical piece and how do you capture that data? And uh, Chris, I feel like you're gonna also say something really quick. Yeah, I mean, the, the other part of it is there's numerous different reasons why students end up being referred to all dead. So there is not one sort of catch-all reason for students to all dead. Some of it is, um, better placement for one-on-one -on -one service. Some of it is credit deficiencies. There's a lot of reasons. So one of the things the research office is going to present in the spring, hopefully, is um, looking at what behavioral or academic or other indicators we can see in fourth grade and in seventh grade that might be predictive of a need for alt ed in the future so that we can intervene in fifth grade and eighth grade before we ever get to high school um, and need to intervene for, for alt ed. So really trying to look upstream, so to speak, of all that as, as well, in terms of figuring out how we can identify students and, and intervene specifically on them. So in some ways, Chris, and, and, and I appreciate that, I'll apply it to me, a, a ninth grade Juan Benitez, uh, right, male, self-identified self, uh, male student. In some ways, the predictors that we're trying not to use, mm. uh, right, in terms of the outcomes so, that you so eloquently spoke to, um, Early enough, we're still looking at subgroup data, all right, because ultimately, it, with these disparities that we have outcomes uh, around, and, and, and clearly here there's an inequity. There are, too, there are too many male students of color. There shouldn't be any students, but here clearly there are male, black, and Latino students, Latinx students, uh, being referred to Alted. So uh, how do we reconcile that, uh, Chris, given that we, we're, we don't want to use predict predictors shouldn't uh, result in the outcomes that we're having, but at the same time, Predictors give us, uh, you know, by student subgroup, some indications uh, here of, of, of what, what's going on early. 
Yeah, absolutely. So it's really a two-pronged approach. So one is to look at predictors that are not necessarily demographic. So are we looking at um, achievement report predictors? Are we looking at um, uh, discipline predictors, things like that. Now we do know that those do have correlates with some of our other subgroup predictors, right? So, so one is to look at that. The other is to look at um, all things being equal, do we still have subgroup membership predictors? And if that's the case, that in addition to indicating that we need intervention support also indicates that we probably need to discuss policy and policy change about the referral process itself, right? So one talks about things that are sort of pre um, fourth grade, the other talks about things that are, might be inherent in our policy. And so we'll talk about both of those in the spring so that we can then come forward with um, maybe some sort of suggestions. Thank you, Mr. Brown. That's the systems piece, yeah. right? That uh, it's not the, the traditional deficit, something's wrong with these students, right? Some, there's, we're using indicators, but that we look at our own policies, our own practices. That's what I wanted to hear, right? So that's, that's to me the most important piece of all of this work that we're also looking at our policies, our protocols, our procedures, our practices, not in the absence of looking at some of this data, right, which relates to yeah. students. So thank you for that, Dr. Mr. Brown. Dr. Benitez, I'd also like to add, and I'm just gonna read a couple of sentences from Pillar 1 and the Learning Acceleration and Support Fund that speak really directly to what you're, what you're asking. Um, the aspiration of the LASP is to intentionally strengthen the district's core academic program for all grades, TK through 12, by redesigning classroom curriculum, enhancing instructional delivery, and taking an accelerated and asset-focused approach to supporting students. In addition to reimagining the core academic program, an equity-driven approach will be used to provide tiered academic interventions tailored to student needs. And I, I don't wanna lose sight of the redesign or the reimagine of the core program. That is the program that every student experiences. That's why we made a huge investment in centering equity and all teachers participating in training this summer along with their administrators. Um, so it is the combination of those two things. It's improving that core program for every student and to use the, the term that Chris Brown's referring to, the going upstream has to improve for all students and then offering strategic, strategic interventions as you've heard actually across levels talk about. And on that note, Dr. Baker, thank you, Dr. Camarillo. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you. Um, let's uh, take a quick uh, recess and then come back for our, yeah, 10, ten minutes? Okay, thank you.
We are going to continue with the next item on our agenda, which is our multilingual office introduction. All right. Good morning, President Benitez, members of the board, Superintendent Baker, and executive staff. As I look around the room, I realize that not all of us have been around long enough to remember that at one point in our district's history, we had an office called PALMS. PALMS stands for Program Assistance for Language Minority Students. So some years ago, we experienced some severe budget cuts. Uh, there's been central office reorganization, changes to funding requirements, and that led to the dismantling of that office and the decentralization of services for our English learners. Um, at that same time, you may recall, we had been expanding our dual immersion programs. So those two things went on simultaneously. So what this meant is that we've had talented teacher leaders and administrators working in different offices. So OCIPD, equity and access, our level offices, research office, kind of, and also then spread across our schools as teachers on special assignment to provide services for English learners. Um, and that means that different offices have been responsible for managing local, state, and federal planning and compliance, progress monitoring for our English learners and redesignation, coordinating support for parents, providing training curriculum for teachers uh, to implement the standards. And we've heard through public comments um, and other means that we've frankly been struggling to provide support for our English learners and our emerging bilingual students, as we call them. So they're not making the progress that we know they're capable of. And we know that these structures are let's say lack of structures, have been a barrier to the student success. So we're really excited today to provide with you a brief update on our efforts to consolidate our services into one coordinated system of support. And that's gonna be held in our office in OCIPD. So I'm gonna turn things over right now to Angelica uh, Gonzalez. She's our Director of Curriculum and Instruction and she's been leading these efforts. that just roll I know you can't see it but it rolled right off the tongue um, members of the board colleagues and members of the public as dr. kale has shared with you one of my crucial responsibilities is providing direction to the leaders and members of the newly developed multilingual office um, an office that merges multilingual and English learner services which include world language um, English learner services and dual immersion um, with the development of this office, like Dr. Kale mentioned, we hope to centralize the support for not just English learners, but multilingual learners to one location with regular collaboration um, from our friends uh, from the research office. Today's presentation will be an introduction of the multilingual office team members, including its two leaders who are here with us today. It is their third day on the job, so please go easy on them. We will also share our office priorities for the year. So here's a visual look at our team. Our multilingual office is led by two coordinators, and I'm going to ask, you're going to hear from them shortly, but I'll ask them to stand. The first being Dr. Olga Grimalt. So Olga, why don't you stand? Dr. Olga Grimalt was our dual immersion coach last year, um, and this year promoted to um, multilingual service coordinator and curriculum lead. She'll be leading the multilingual services and curriculum division of our multilingual office, which includes world language, supported by Terry Hauser, who last year was with us 50%. She spent 50% of her day teaching Spanish for Spanish speakers at Jordan High School. This year will be with us 100% of the time, so we're super excited. Also joined by Zenia Yvette McAllister, who we took from Henry, sorry Henry. Uh, she'll be our 100% dual immersion coach. We are also continuing um, with Dareth Ung. Dareth Ung is what I call a LBUSD treasure. Dareth Ung is our, at Wilson teaches 50% of the time, our Kamai for Kamai speakers teacher. The only teacher in the state of California credentialed, single subject credential in Kamai. Um, he will be our language support here um, as we intentionally work with the Kamai community to grow the language programs. Angelica, can you say that one more time? I love yes. the way that rolled off your <laughs> tongue. About Dareth? About our only... So Dareth Ung uh, is the only teacher in the state of California who has, has a single subject credential 
to teach Kamai. So we have, yes, an applause. That's why he is a treasure. He spent a lot of his year last year supporting the translation unit in a time of need. It was a need to support the Kamai translation. This year he'll be working, um, he'll be working with our office and, and doing less translation services. We also have continuing with us David Noyes. He has been a one-man show in OCIPD's efforts to support English learners, so he is welcoming the, the additional support. Um, I'm sorry, then I was gonna jump to our other, our other coordinator. So also leading the English Learner Service Division is Martha Ensminger. So Martha, why don't you stand up? Can you see her? Martha comes to us from the Office of Equity and Access, and she will be leading the English Learner Service Division focusing on coordinating English learner services, programs, assessments, protocols, as well as parent engagement. Supporting her will also be Derrit. So Derrit's split down the middle between Kamai Heritage Language and English Learner Supports. Um, also supported by David, like I mentioned, and coming to us from Cabrillo High School, but the year before was teaching dual immersion at Lafayette is Dr. Sandra Velasco, who brings a wealth of knowledge um, with engaging communities. So what excites me most about the creation of this office is that we are all, every single person in that box, we are experienced bilingual educators and most of us English learners ourselves. Uh, we're dedicated to breaking down those structural barriers that, barriers that Dr. Kale mentioned that have existed for far too long in our system. Um, we are we are excited to support the equitable outcomes for English learners with the ultimate goal, though, of not just English proficiency, of really developing ba balanced bilinguals or balanced multilinguals. We don't want to limit them to two languages, right? Okay, so in a minute, I'm going to ask Martha to join me as we share with you some of the priority areas um, under the English Learner Services Division. First, beginning with progress monitoring updating the redesignation process criteria, which is a collaborative process with the Office of Research, how we're planning on strengthening the homeschool connection, and the professional development we have planned. So we'll begin with progress monitoring. You have in front of you, or you should have as part of your packet, what we're calling an English learner's fact sheet, which we created as part of our Summer Equity Institute English Learner Modules. And what it is, is what we plan to do is regular reporting of EL data. And not just EL data the way we've typically reported it, but disaggregated, it looks like this, yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. What we were intentional doing is that we, we try to disaggregate it as much as we could. We identify the four major typologies of an English learner. On the left-hand side, we share the primary languages that we find in our English learners, which represent 49 languages. So that's a very diverse group of English learners. Um, and what we plan on doing is using this data for, for not just communicating, but also um, identifying areas of focus that are needed for future supports and intervention, but also in addressing those systemic barriers. We're also, when it comes to progress monitoring, shifting a focus on individual student progress monitoring, not just academic measures, but social emotional measures. Okay, so I'm gonna hand it over to Martha to continue. Good morning, it is a pleasure being here with you today. I will now cover in more detail each of the priority areas of our English learner services. Our first priority is our redesignation process. I want to inform you that we use the terms um, redesignation and reclassification interchangeably. Redesignation is a process whereby a student who has been identified as an English learner is then redesignated to become, because he is a fluent English proficient student. And we have two separate times in which redesignation occurs here uh, during the academic year. Round one occurs between mid to late September, and we wanna share some current data as of yesterday, the number of students that were reclassified during our pandemic year. Um, we have 278 elementary school students, 87 middle school, and 40 high school students. The same local criteria was used, so there was no updates during round, um, during round one. 
Uh, we did revise, however, the worksheet to document parent contact. And that stemmed from many conversations I've had with our EL parents during, during DLOC or English uh, Leadership Institute and ELOC meetings that many of our parents either were not contacted during the reclassification process of their eligibility of their students. So we wanted to make sure that parents are involved in the process during reclassification. Round two happens in the spring and we, did, we have selected to update one of the uh, criterions and we'll be recommending the use of the new assessment tool, iReady. And I know that our assistant superintendent, Chris Brown, presented a very detailed uh, presentation to you regarding the new assessment tool, iReady. In addition, we have also uh, revised um, the official RFEP worksheet to include a parent's signature. Once again, to make sure that our EL parents are being, um, um, are being included during the reclassification process. And you will have the opportunity to consider our reclassification updates during your board approval sometime in October. The second priority focuses on increasing English learner parent engagement. Our office will be, will be working closely with sites to ensure that our EL parents are informed about our parent advisory committees. Today I want to address two in particular, two committees in particular that are targeted for our EL parents. The first being DLAC, which is our District English Learner Advisory Committee, which I'm the coordinator <laughs> of DLAC. And we meet on a monthly basis uh, throughout the year and the DLAC committee focuses on very specific EL tasks. For example, they focus and, and provide input on the redesignation process. They provide input um, regarding LCAP and the uh, allocation of services for EL students. And in addition, annually, they provide recommendations to you, the board, regarding programs and services as it relates to English learners. The second committee is our ELAC, which is our English Language um, Advisory Committee. It happens at the site level. And very similar to DLAC, they also address very specific EL tasks at the respective sites when it comes to what, what are the needs of English learners at those sites. So we want to make sure that um, our school sites are supporting our parents by ensuring that our EL parents are engaged in these two parent committees. Next, our office will schedule additional opportunities for EL parents to participate in our English Learner Parent Institute. This institute will provide additional opportunities to empower parents by providing workshops such as getting to know the California Dashboard, LCAP, LCFF, Title I, Title III funding, just to name a few. So we want to make sure that we provide workshops beyond what DLAC and ELAC provide. And the goal of the Institute is to empower parents to the point of assuming leadership roles in order to encourage and engage other parents. Um, so basically the way that I see this Institute is um, Leader, the, the parent leaders becoming parent mentors themselves for other parents. And um, we're really looking forward to seeing how that's going to evolve. I did start the Parent uh, Leadership Institute two years ago. And in 2019, 2020, we, we were averaging about 90 to 100 parents uh, every month. So there's definitely a need and an interest there. And last year during our virtual, we still held them and I was averaging about 65 parents. So we wanna make sure that we continued with these, um, um, this institute because there is a need and there's a, a big interest from our EL parents. Next is our support for our newcomer, immigrant and migrant support. And these families and students bring very unique experiences and thus require additional support beyond the typical support that we provide our EL parents and families and students. Therefore, our office will collaborate with school sites to develop strategies and support systems to engage our newcomer and migrant students and their families at both the district and at the site level. 
Some of these efforts seek to expand and strengthen opportunities to build capacity to our parents by providing very specific workshops, such as learning how to navigate the U.S. educational system. It's very important. In addition, uh, it will facilitate support systems to help our newcomer and migrant students in and outside the school environment. These students are often navigating new cultural landscapes and social norms without or very little support. And I believe that our district and our school can play an important role in helping our students establish new social support networks so they feel a sense of belonging and have the emotional support that they so desperately need. Another focus is our professional development. Beginning with our District Summer Equity Institute, we have provided three modules of professional development for all teachers and administrators, focusing on meeting the needs of our English learners. That learning will continue this year through the instructional leadership teams focusing on designated and integrated English language development. We will set, we will, <coughs> excuse me, we will communicate clear expectations and accountability process. We will provide sustained language and content support. In addition, our professional develop will focus on an asset-based pedagogy. For many years in general, ELL students have been regarded as students who come with a deficit, gaps in their knowledge. To regard these students as emergent bilingual or multilingual learners suggests that there is value in their native language and cultural background, in addition to the many contributions that they bring into our classrooms. Therefore, we are working on a shift in language use from that of an English language learner to emergent bilinguals or multilingual learners. Thank you. And at this time, I will turn over our continued presentation to Dr. Olga Grimald, who will share with you the uh, multilingual priorities. Good morning. Happy to be here with you today to talk about our dual language programs. Oops, let me, there we go. Last year, I joined OCIPD to support our dual language programs. And so today I wanna to share with you what some of that support looked like last year and how we're going to continue to support our programs and also talk to you about our plans for expanding our dual language programs. So here we're sharing a list of our six elementary schools and our middle school program. Bixby and Chavez being our most recent additions. Bixby began in 2018. They're adding third grade this year. And Chavez, we launched last fall um, with two kindergarten classrooms and they're adding first grade this year. And so really um, proud of the launching of the Chavez program, if I can say for a moment, because we launched in the middle of a pandemic fully online with two classes of kindergartners learning in two languages. So I'm just really proud of the fact that we launched that um, successfully. And then as you see our other elementary schools, Henry, Lafayette, Willard, and Webster, we've had those programs running for quite some time. Middle school program, um, Keller Middle School. So across our programs, in a moment I'll talk to you about the two different models that our programs represent, but across our models they have the same goals. All of our programs are striving towards bilingualism and biliteracy, academic excellence in two languages, and sociocultural socio competence. So regardless of the model that they follow, we're all looking um, towards reaching the same goals. So I'm gonna start with the 90-10 program. Our 90-10 programs, 90% 90 of instruction is in Spanish in kindergarten, 10% of the instruction is in English, and then as we go up in the grades, the percentage of English instruction increases until we reach a 50-50 um, distribution, usually in fourth grade. And this type of program is referred to as a sequential literacy program. And here's just a graph of, that represents the language distribution by grade level. So you can see in the beginning grades, there's a focus on the development of Spanish in the early grades. Our other model that we offer is the 50-50 dual language model, 
And in the 50-50 model, 50% 50 of the instruction is in, in Spanish, 50% is in English, kinder through fifth grade. And this program model is referred to as a simultaneous literacy program. The students are learning how to read and write in both English and Spanish. And then here's just a graph that shows how it's equal across the grade levels. And one thing I failed to mention as I began was that we do have in your handout just a flyer that we created last year as well that gives some of the basic information about our programs. So one of the things I wanted to point out that with our 90-10 and 50-50 programs, again, the goals are, are the same for the programs, and both programs teach content areas in both languages. So the students are not only learning these two languages, they're also learning content through those languages. And the biggest difference between them is just how they acquire literacy, right? So being, and our 90-10 programs are focused being Spanish literacy first, as a bridge towards English literacy, and in the 50-50s, they're doing both simultaneously. So last year, when I came to OCIPD, the bulk of the support was supporting our teachers with online resources. Um, so we came on and started off with creating a Smart Start unit guides, similar to the ELA guides, and then moved into creating um, digital resources for Spanish language arts and math. So I worked closely with the ELA office and the math office in order to provide those um, resources and also with an amazing team of dual immersion teachers at different sites that also supported that work. I could not have done it without those teachers. Um, and then this year we also, so the green one that says Gramatica is just a representation of one of those resources. Um, this summer, I know um, Mr. Moskowitz mentioned earlier about the SEAL program curriculum in the summer. Um, we also launched Seal en Español this year and for the first time offered an official LBUSD summer school offering in Spanish. And this year we offered it kinder through second grade, provided the curriculum for it as well, um, and was really happy to be able to offer that this summer. Also, in just looking at resources for Spanish language arts, we know that in English students have access to Core 5, we don't have, a, we didn't have like a comparable program and Core 5 doesn't come in Spanish. So we were able to provide learning A to Z for all of our dual immersion teachers in the district so that they had another resource for their students and for themselves as well in the development of Spanish literacy. And then currently to the far right are the unit guides that we're currently working on for Smart Restart, again for the support of Spanish um, literacy. And so now I want to talk a little bit about, well, and before I talk about expansion, just to round out that we will continue to support our schools and our teachers this year um, in curriculum, through assessments. That was another area last year that we looked at in looking at um, updating our assessments um, for Spanish. So now as I move into the expansion plan, um, last year we received a lot of interest from our community for dual immersion programs. And so um, we surveyed all elementary school families, asking them two questions. One, are you interested in a dual language program? And two, what languages are you interested in having the program? So our district has historically only had Spanish English programs. I'm gonna go back, that's not entirely true because prior to 227, we did have a Khmer language program in our district. But um, anyhow, so we surveyed all elementary school families um, and we're just looking at the data that was provided to see, do our schools, what is the overall EL composition of our schools? We know that the optimal um, composition of our school classrooms in these programs would be to have half of a classroom of fluent Spanish speakers and half classroom of English speakers. So just looking where are our Spanish speaking EL students across our district. Looking at the school um, and analyzing how many teachers at each of the schools already hold the bilingual authorization in Spanish. And, and then our plan is to continue to collaborate with the elementary office to develop a plan for expansion. So just in terms of just taking this first step of just identifying schools and where those pieces um, fall. The other piece that we are looking at is the Kamai language program. 
And we have met with the community twice. We met with them um, first in January. Dareth and I had an initial meeting with them in, in January. And then our most recent meeting was in June. And Dr. Baker and um, Angelica and myself and Dareth were at that meeting. So during that meeting, we were there to listen to their request and to talk about um, possible program options. And one of the results of that meeting that um, we discussed with them was the challenges and not being able to implement a dual immersion program or a Kamai dual immersion program at this time. Some of the challenges or the barriers to that are the curriculum materials that we would need in Kamai, especially across the curriculum and the lack of teachers who hold the bilingual authorization in Kamai. So one of the things that Dareth and I have talked about and looking at is how we can um, identify teachers who could possibly pursue the authorization. And we know that there are several ways of doing that, one of them being through, through the test that the CTC offers. So one of the program options that we are looking at is a heritage language program. So a heritage language program is a language program that's designed to address the needs of heritage language speakers. So in this case, it would be for the Cam Cambodian community in terms of the development of Khmer. So the program would be um, open for Khmer speaking students, um, Cambodian students who are Khmer learners, and it can also be open to other members of the community that are interested in learning and becoming fluent in Khmer. And one of our next steps is to meet with the committee um, or the parent association again and um, present to them this two-year proposed plan. So year one starting this fall, um, Whittier already has an after-school Kamai program and expanding that program is offered currently one day a week and so we're looking at offering it more than once. It's currently being taught by a community member so we're looking at identifying our Kamai speaking teachers within our district um, for interest to see if we can have one of our own teachers teaching the after school program and then looking to develop curriculum so working with Dareth and seeing if we can develop some robust curriculum for that program um, and then just working again to see if we can identify teachers that would pursue the bilingual authorization in Kamai. And then looking towards the following year of um, working with the community to design the heritage language program um, it was clear from the community that they want a program during the school day. And so that is why we're, we're looking at this option. Um, we think we'd, we'd like to continue the after school program even if we have a heritage language program and then expanding that program to the middle school as well. And so with that, that concludes my part. I just wanna say in closing that I'm really excited about the work that we're doing with our dual language programs and just excited about the work ahead. And so now we, I think it's our time for questions. Colleagues, questions, <laughs> thoughts? Um, I'll just mention that I'm glad to know we're working on providing um, a Kumai heritage language program because I know that our Cambodian community is um, very much in favor of that and I know that we had something in the past and then there were challenges with having enough teachers that um, were uh, certified to, to teach um, the language so I think that's one of the challenges but um, hopefully we can develop a program where we're developing our own um, pipeline for, for teachers that will go into that area. Um, I, I know from what I've learned with this community, they take such pride, mm -hmm. you know, such pride in um, their heritage and being able to maintain that language and pass it down to the younger generations and keep it going is, is very important. So I'm, I'm very glad to see that we're working on that. So thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for this presentation. This is an incredible team mm -hmm. of people in this multilingual office. And I know 
Um, we've done, there's been some reorganization within the central office, so some people might hear this and say, oh, there's another central office office, but this is really a repurposing of some folks, as you said, who were spread out in different offices to have this very powerful team of people to look at the system and how we do better, um, and just want to thank you for that. I'm one of those people who appreciates a good system because I know, as you indicated, what a good system does is allow for equitable services to all locations, so when it's something like this is dispersed to a site level responsibility, we know um, there can be some challenges in that. So I'm excited that, that this kind of support will exist for our teachers and administrators at every school site and that they can come to you for that support. Um, and that you're experienced bilingual educators and many former EL students. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's really mm -hmm. important for the public to hear that piece because I know it brings, um, I've worked with you enough, Angie, that it brings a passion to your work and I'm grateful Absolutely. for that. Um, Martha snuck out and I just wanted to um, acknowledge the work that she has done over the years with um, our parent groups, especially when we're talking about parent engagement with our DLAC and our ELAC and our institutes and all of the extra things that she does. I know sometimes when we tend to talk, there's some talk out there with different parent groups that somehow DLAC and ELAC you know, are different than a potential community group that would come to us because somehow they're within the system. Um, and I make it a point to try and attend as many of the, the DLAC meetings as I can and sit in the back um, with my translation piece because that group in that room of 90 or 100 people are incredibly fierce, dedicated, talented people who are working hard to support every student across the district. Um, and I just wanted her to hear that, so if someone could pass that along to her. Absolutely, we'll let her know. Um, that the work that she does to cultivate community, uh, because those meetings aren't always easy. No. They, they, are, they can be challenging, they put staff on the spot, they're asking really hard questions and have very high expectations. Um, and she has cultivated that um, that relationship with them. So I just wanted to shout out those folks who are dedicated uh, month after month, sometimes year after year of parent leaders who then go on to have these other roles on our school sites um, as one of the really fundamental voices. And, and just because that group exists within um, the structure um, makes it, uh, it doesn't make it any less important than other voices. Um, and I just wanted her to, to hear that from me because I, when I go to those meetings, I don't always have an opportunity to thank her, but it is clearly on display in those meetings that those parent leaders take their role seriously in advancing the cause of every uh, emerging bilingual student in the district. Um, and, and that's in direct result to the hard work that she and her team, I know Dulnari was on that group for a long time who's now moved to elementary, um, but you've worked hard to really cultivate an act, an, active advocacy group for our, our emerging bilingual students um, in that direct work that she's done in community and parent engagement. Yeah. And we look forward to supporting her through the lens of curriculum and, and instructional supports as well. So I have a lot of thoughts to share about this. I won't share them all uh, today. Uh, first <laughs> off, um, Dr. Baker, I think this provides additional uh, rationale, additional reason, additional incentive um, around the momentum in our language access, language justice uh, work, right? So on the one hand, as we're uplifting our appreciation uh, and highlighting uh, that appreciation for multilingualism, multiculturalism, um, that's in direct connection with us doing right by uh, supporting mm -hmm. those students and families who speak mm -hmm. uh, these wonderful additional languages, uh, right? Again, from our systems approach, right? I think it's a good anchor uh, between, between both. And so um, I appreciate uh, highlighting uh, the great things we're doing in terms of our DI program. Uh, at the same time, I think it would be good for us for the reasons that um, Ms. Craig had just shared to get some ongoing updates on our, our Kamai uh, Heritage Language uh, Program. Uh, we have had a lot of public comment and folks have reached out to us. So um, if, if we could j just get, you know, at some point, start getting some updates on how that's going. I know it's a two-year plan, so uh, I think that would be good for us and good for our community uh, to get updates on that. Uh, I love, 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 I can't say it enough, our shift to um, the stigma attached to EL Absolutely. and English learners to emergent uh, bilinguals and multi multilingual, multilingual learners uh, mm -hmm. here. So kudos uh, for that shift, Dr. Kale. 
Uh, and, and again, this, this goes back to this sort of subtractive deficit um, narrative that, that some of which is attached to, quite frankly, some of the hesitancy, and I'll speak for our Spanish language speakers, in enrolling students in our DI uh, programs because of that stigma that has historically and to this day been attached uh, to bilingual education and the way that it was implemented or not, uh, right? So, so I appreciate, uh, again, the asset-based, uh, community-centered uh, language shift. Um, so I'm gonna go back to that sort of stigma mm -hmm. attached to our EL. So I do see some improvement in the data that was shared in that English learner at a glance. Um, I'm wondering if we could speak a little bit to um, what our plans are this year, particularly for our long-term uh, English learners that have, are coming off of a year and a half, two years plus. Uh, and, and any, again, uh, anything that you can share in terms of targeted interventions. My understanding is these are students that have been with us five years uh, or more and have not been redesignated, re reclassified. So can we speak a little bit uh, to that? And then I have one, one last question after that. Sure. Um, so the first step in, in identifying interventions or supports for these students is knowing who they are, right? And so that work began with the Summer Equity Institute with teachers, uh, learning who their students are, encouraging them. Um, so really putting the data in front of teachers so they're aware of who exactly is sitting in their classroom, who is a long-term English learner or in danger of becoming a long-term English language learner. Um, in addition is that we're providing professional development to help those teachers support them through what they really need, which is, for the most part, language supports. So it's what about the language within my content is, is the roadblock, is the barrier to understanding the content. And so that's the, the specific support that students need is the language supports. Um, and so that's where we're focusing our professional development around. Thank you. And then my last question, um, could we get the breakdown? So as I'm reading this, we have 10,314 students last year that were um, classified as ELs. And then um, the ever EL students are ELs plus RFEPs. I understand that. Could we get uh, just a little bit of context on the long-term English learners as I'm reading this? This past year, we had 22. 116 students out of 10298. Um, why is that 10298 different than the 10314 that because, we have? Because it represents the previous year's data. Got so it. we're always we're on a continuous, and Chris can speak to this, on a continuous Got cycle it. of catching up with data. Got it. When is the data available? Um, you'll notice that we say we're going to that we'll get a, we're going to republish this around October uh -huh. because we're constantly waiting for data to arrive. Uh -huh. Right. And so that is using, if you notice, that 10,298 is the previous year's total Got of it. English learners. Got it. And so we're, we're behind a year when it comes to long term. Yeah, and, and I was interpreting the asterisk right below to, to indicate that, that we're yes. a, a, sort of a year behind. Right. Um, so question on our DI, and I'm super excited uh, about our, especially Bixby and Chavez that are just getting going. And Chavez, we had a big event to kick off the summer uh, Brian, where you ate 250 paletas all on your own. Um, so um, again, w right now, one of the things in, in, in our Spanish-speaking communities is a hesitancy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and really, I think part of that is just a community education on what DI is, um, what the benefits of DI uh, are. And so could you talk a little bit about the um, difference between what we use to determine whether we're gonna use a 90-10 uh, model versus a 50-50 model, because I think it's important for our communities, especially uh, in the downtown central area, and as the Cambodian uh, Khmer-speaking community is listening to this, uh, how we approach the 90-10 model, the 50-50 model, and what we need, uh, really, for those models to work from our additional uh, language-speaking uh, communities. Sure, I'll address the first part, yeah. and then I'll hand it over to Dr. Yeah. Grimald to um, respond to the, the model question. Um, I completely agree, Dr. Benitez. We need to change the narrative for our, for our English learner families so that they understand that dual immersion is a viable option for their families as a mechanism to acquire English language. And, and although that seems like an oxymoron, um, it's gonna be our task to change that narrative. 
Um, the state sees dual immersion as a viable option uh, for English language development. Um, and so we need to change that narrative here in Long Beach. So Olga, if you want to ask, answer the questions? Yes, about the 9010. So, uh, I, you know, some of you know that I came back to the district after being gone for 10 years in 2018 to help launch the Bixby program and taught kindergarten for two years at Bixby. And at that time, we, that program was launched as a 9010 program because it was a, a, a desire or the, the goal to, to streamline our program models. And, um, and so the 9010 model was the one that was selected in terms of going forward, all of our programs will be 9010 programs. The fact that we have 9010s and 5050s is because of at the time that they were being implemented, um, that's just how it evolved at that time. I, I was in the district when Lafayette was being developed, and I don't know the reasons why the 5050 was selected at that time, but I just know that in that time, around the late 90s, when it was being developed, they chose 5050. Um, our Webster program used to be a 9010, and around the time, around 227 passing, it had been shifted to a 5050 model. Um, but I know that the plan going forward is that our programs will all be 9010 programs, which is why Bixby and both Chavez are 9010s. And then I agree with you as well that the need to, to do community meetings and to really speak directly to those communities in terms of explaining how the program works, why it's beneficial to their students. I have parents all the time telling me, well, yo hablo español en la casa. You know, I, I take care of Spanish at home, and, and I always share with them that my daughters are bilingual. They went through the program here in the district as well, but I'm not sitting at home having conversations about renewable energy in Spanish with my kids. I'm not in English either. And so <laughs> I said, so I said, so I'll, I would tell the parents, my Spanish is like, did you, de la base los dientes, ven a comer, you know, it's very just, we're on the run, right? So anyway, so I do talk to the families about the importance of the academic Spanish and the level of, of language that they engage in in these programs. Yeah. And, and to your point, it, it behooves us, right, because we need a critical mass for these models and these Absolutely. programs to work Absolutely. of native English-speaking households and non-native English-speaking households, right? They, they don't work without Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for the presentation. Can I just give kudos one more time? Um, this was one of those things where you guys walked and chewed gum and, chewed gum and skipped a beat and probably did a jump rope um, in doing the district-wide uh, interest and assessment. Um, and I know that was born out of uh, parents' uh, desires in different communities, but but instead of just addressing those those one or two or three schools, you took it upon yourselves in May and June of this year. Um, to really blanket and get that information for every school in the district. Um, so I think it speaks to our intention to expand this program. And I know Mr. Moskovitz and I have had those conversations um, that there is a desire within this district to expand to other schools as we change the narrative and we meet um, the requirements for successful programs in different parts of the community. So thank you for taking that on in the middle of all of this and summer school. Um, I appreciate it. And we appreciate your support. Um, board member Kerr for encouraging us to do that feasibility study as you helped support us through the language request at two other elementary schools so thank you I just have a couple of quick comments <laughs> um, I just want to um, say that by including the parents in that reclassification process we're uh, acknowledging the role that the parents play in their student success so I like the move um, in going that way in that um, type of parent engagement. So thank you for that. Um, I also made a note of the, uh, the deficit language around English learners and appreciate so much the, um, I guess the use of, of terms like emergent bilingual and multilingual learners. And that, I think it, it's such a small detail but it gives it so much more value that we are valuing um, our, our students' ability to become bilingual, biliterate, and bicultural. And when you visit our schools that have these programs and you see what these students are capable of, it's truly impressive. And so I'm very happy that the language matches the value that we put into the programs. And, and then also in looking at um, this data, I'm wondering if the 
EL um, acronym will change maybe to ML. Yes, yeah, so that's EB. an ongoing conversation we're having. <laughs> and, and right now the data by the state and the national data is reported as EL. And so we haven't made the official shift because the data is still coming in as EL. And so to not confuse the entire system, we are introducing the asset-based terms um, and we're using them interchangeably, but official data will continue to be the way it's reported to us. So until that changes. We can do it. We did it for Hispanic to Latinx. Right, let's so do it. So we can do it. All right. All right. Yes, uh, who do we need to talk to? <laughs> I think the team is here. That, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to make those changes, uh, you know. Uh, okay, thank you so much uh, you. again. Uh, we're, we're a little bit still behind on schedule, but I'd like to move along to our next item, which is our school facilities uh, update. Looks like we're ready. Presentation's queued up. So right first of all, thank you members of the board, Superintendent Baker, executive staff, and our audience for allowing us the time to present this facilities update. It's always a pleasure to really speak to our building program efforts, our bond efforts, and just other facility projects across the board. You'll see just kind of in the spirit of, of starting a new school year, we've gone with a new theme of our presentation, right? So new background kind of rebranding in a sense in terms of our presentation in that format, and we're really excited in that respect. Also for this morning, I have a special co-presenter. So you'll notice the name there, Celeste Aguilar from Wilson High School. She was part of our summer intern program, and I really want that to be the highlight of our presentation this morning, right? So there's plenty of ground to cover, a lot of different factors I'm gonna speak to, uh, yet we're gonna put Celeste here front and center. She's gonna do a great job. I've heard on a couple occasions, board member Craig had mentioned when we put our students front and center, they do a great job. I think you'll see another example of that this morning as well. Mr. Miranda, before um, we get Ms. Aguilar up here, we have, I haven't looked through the rest of the presentation, but board member Kerr and I were just having a conversation. Um, so Leticia yesterday handed over to me uh, two stacks of our public comment papers, and um, I, I, I don't see color uh, as well as everyone else. So if there are, is there any uh, presentation slides, data that are color quoted, I appreciate uh, a legend or a differentiation of colors. The chart for our ELs, um, I only saw two colors, but the legend below, uh, you know, helped me that there are four different colors uh, on that chart. So just a heads up, I don't know if I've shared that with all staff or what have you, that legends are super helpful uh, because I can't see, there could be four or five colors on the graph. Uh, I may only be able to see two. Uh, no, that's those that's a great heads up, not only for today, for future reference Thank as you. well. Uh, I think for the most part, we have facts, figures, and pictures uh, as part of our presentation for facilities. Perfect. But regardless, if I do stumble across one of those, I'll make sure to describe that as well. So again, even though we've gone to a different theme in terms of the background for the presentation, generally we have the same categories. Uh, I want to start off by giving a project and program update. I'm still continuing on in terms of breaking it up into three chunks, right? So recently completed projects active projects, and then of course projects that are coming down the pipeline. We wanna to speak to the community workforce development agreement and just where we are and what the next steps are in that respect. I'm gonna then turn it over to Celeste to primarily speak to the internship program. I may jump in just cause I wanna give a few extra kudos to certain folks during that aspect of the presentation. And I figure at that point, that might be a good point for us to break for a few questions or comments for Celeste. And then of course I'll field additional questions at the tail end of the presentation once I circle back and address a few other facility related matters. Uh, so first and foremost, in terms of the building program update, we're doing great things, right? So it's funny, I bumped into Angie in the back. She mentioned, David, that looks like a big presentation. And I said, it's because we do big things, right? So in terms of what we're doing, we hadn't updated these fun facts uh, really since pre-COVID. So I wanted to make sure we do that at this point in time and just hit you with a few numbers in terms of number of classrooms that have now been outfitted and retrofitted with new HVAC systems and general modernization. And then of course, what the total number of students are that are benefiting from, from these improvements, right? We did use enrollment figures um, from the previous school year, right? Just as a point of reference. So I wanted to make sure I identify that matter as well. 
But you see the numbers, they're staggering, right? They continue to climb. They'll continue to climb as we advance into our bond program. We're currently in what we call phase six of our bond program with Measure E, but of course it's gonna continue on for the years that follow. Recently completed projects, you see a few of them highlighted. I often say that the pictures don't give the work justice, uh, even though the pictures are outstanding, right? So you, you see a number of them pictured there, some auditorium work, really a typical classroom post-construction. And then of course the improvements and aerial shot there of Millikan's new track and field in use, right? So you see there's folks in the bleachers, there's activities happening on the game field itself. And we're just happy to show off the work that's continuing on in that respect as well. There's a number of projects you see down towards the bottom of that slide, Coverly, Fremont, Madison, and Prisk. Those are what we consider the phase five HVSE improvements as part of Measure E program. And the typical scope of work that we continue to address, right? So not only adding in air conditioning systems where they did not, did not exist, but also addressing accessibility improvements, um, other building components along the way, right? Because it just makes sense to do other type of work once you know, the grid's exposed, the ceilings are down, it makes sense to do lighting, sometimes painting, flooring, ceilings, windows, and so forth, right? So those efforts continue. We've now switched gears and officially kind of moved out the construction crews and moved the, the educators back in to those respective schools. Um, seems like all is good. Uh, there's always a few little finishing touches we're doing in terms of punch list items with contractors, but that's all going very well uh, as well. In terms of active projects, there's quite a few. And actually this is what I would call major projects because there's a handful more that I don't list, right? So there's other things going on in terms of electronic visitor screenings, additional safety improvements, uh, other moves of staff members and offices and whatnot that are not listed here. But in terms of some of the major projects, the first one you see on the list is Wilson High School. That's still considered part of phase five, but that was a two year project. So it's continuing on. We're roughly at the midpoint for Wilson High School. But things are going well. Uh, of course, we talked about this on the front end in terms of unforeseen conditions we encounter on schools of this age. We continue to encounter some of that, right? Uh, but we did learn quite a bit just in transitioning from phase one at Wilson into phase two and phase three and so forth. Uh, we've picked up a little momentum in terms of construction. So uh, I feel we're in a good position just in terms of Wilson High School and those improvements as they continue to go along. We've now started um, a, a number of projects over at Robinson, Bryant, Hughes, and Twain in terms of those HVAC enhancements with a similar scope of work that I described for, for the phase five projects previously. Um, we were able to do a little shifting around, which also helped us and helped the district. So with Robinson, we're able to push our construction schedule back just a few more weeks so we can host a summer program out there, right? So that was something the contractor cooperated us, uh, with us on. And it really helped us out in the long run also because it allowed us to kind of move and stack the deck in terms of other moves that had to happen to and from other projects and other sites. So we're in, good, we're, we're, we're in a good place and we're officially underway at every one of those sites as well. We've switched gears and you see it pictured there, uh, the Lakewood High School track and field. Relatively current, uh, an updated picture you see there. So you see the, the, the field surface itself has been laid out. Uh, of course, that means all the infrastructure work that comes below it has been complete in terms of drainage and, and you know, all the things that happen below the carpet, I say, right? So that's all been addressed. Um, the track will follow uh, relatively soon here. And then there's other infrastructure related work we're doing just in terms of um, the bleachers and lighting and a few other improvements as part of that project. You see a picture also on the right there of our electronic door locks. So of course, not too long ago, I was before the board addressing this very project and seeking approval, right? and that approval was for a pilot project. So what we have now and what we have pictured, there's a door over at Bigsby Elementary. That was our first of the pilot sites where we just officially broke ground and started the implementation. Really what I wanna highlight here is the collaboration. So you see a, a number of maintenance folks pictured there. We've, we've included them every step of the way in terms of input and feedback with respect to the, the actual product, the material itself but also in terms of the training components that come with this type of project, right? This is really a game changer in terms of what we do and what we'll continue to do out there, how we address stored hardware and, and just access. Um, there's also been multiple layers in terms of uh, training with the Tisby folks, with our school safety folks. Actually, there was another photo I should have included there where it actually shows um, our school safety folks getting trained on the card readers and how to implement and roll out those systems as well. Our thought with, with respect to those card readers, because uh, it's basically gonna be our, our ID badge that now doubles as that card reader that opens a door. Um, 
we are going to go out to the schools, right? So we're not going to have school sites or teachers come back over to the school safety office to, to be issued a new badge. We'll go to the school sites and make sure uh, you know, we, we have less disruption in a sense. And then, of course, Jordan Phase 2B um, officially broke ground recently, had, had a good ceremony out there and a great turnout. A little warm that day, but, but it was fun. So uh, I'm glad we were able to celebrate the, really the continued transformation of that campus. Event went along well, and we're officially underway. So within the next couple of weeks, if you were to drive by that campus, you'll officially see some demolition work taking place. That's often fun. It goes really fast. You know, in a blink of an eye, you see the building gone, right? So as a reminder, there's four single-story buildings generally off of Atlantic Avenue there that will be demolished to make way for a new two-story 14-classroom building as well as, uh, as well as a new enhanced courtyard, lunch shelter, and just other improvements along the way as well. And plan projects. I always like highlighting these just to kind of tease what's coming down the pipeline. Uh, of course, there's our next series, what I would call phase seven of our HVAC improvements. Uh, one of them, just to give extra highlight and attention to, is Avalon, because that one actually is slated to start not in a traditional summer stretch where we typically do it. Rather, we're able to start that one in January. Um, so this January, January 2022, we'll actually get started on Avalon. We officially have a lease leaseback contractor on board already. We're currently bidding uh, subcontractor work as we speak. So we'll put the finishing touches on those bids um, and really hit the ground running with respect to Avalon as well. Of course, there's logistical challenges and, and other things that come with construction on the island, but we're ready. So we've had meeting upon meeting and conversation upon conversation just to vet out you know, anything and everything that could happen. So we, we definitely feel as ready as can be in terms of that project. There's a few projects that are pictured there or renderings that are pictured. Those are actually our early concepts for the Hamilton and Keller uh, projects. So actually you see Keller pictured up top, the first two or top two uh, are Keller locker room project, project images. And then the one down at the bottom is Hamilton and their proposed new gymnasium. Both of those projects are continuing on in terms of uh, the appropriate planning and, and DSA and state approval type um, approvals really that we need to secure. And, and we're very much in line to start construction on both of those projects next year as well, so next summer. Uh, of course, what you see pictured there, and just as, as somewhat of a reminder, uh, those two projects in particular, along with Wilson Aquatic Center and our new building at Jordan High School, were part of our pilot for inclusive facilities, right? So you see one potential image up top there. It has, has enhanced and developed a little further to date, but really what you generally see there is private changing rooms uh, instead of kids changing out for PE clothes in an open forum, right? So definitely providing that privacy for all. In our community workforce agreement, I'll just provide a couple highlights here and then we'll dive right into the internship program. Uh, but really where we are, and to piggyback off my previous statement, um, Jordan High School Phase 2B and the new, new building I described is our first project that was on our project list for the Community Workforce Development Agreement, uh, really in partnership with our Trades Council and Building Council, and we're excited to get that off and running, right? There's going to be a few more that follow. There's actually a project list that follows this slide, just so you have that at your fingertips in terms of which of the 15 projects. I've referenced 15 projects plenty of times, right? But let's see which of those 15 actually fell on that list. So we have that as part of the next slide. Um, we've often emphasized and highlighted what our program goals are. And of course, the primary one being let, let's have a local workforce. Let, let's up that percentage figure. Historically, we've targeted 20% as a district, and we've done well. Uh, we've pretty much hovered around that mark for several years now. Uh, now we're targeting 40%. What we'll do as, as a staff is we'll work with our third-party consultant, who's our administrator for this agreement, in terms of providing the data and showing the metrics, right? So what I envision is, is us having a couple columns on a spreadsheet, one where we show how we're stacking up in terms of every bond project, and then a secondary column to show how we're doing on the CWDA ag agreement and those respective projects. And we'll continue to provide that quarterly as well. Of course, there's student hire goals, um, priority access into the apprenticeship program, uh, scholarship programs that are part of this as well. Uh, now, we've been strategic and, and somewhat intentional in terms of how we roll out uh, those next components. We've continued dialogue with Chris Hannon and our Trades Council as well. But really, I mentioned the strategy and being intentional there because we really had to do step one before step two, right? So we had to get some of these projects off the ground before we can really commit our union folks and our trade partners 
to pony up and start some of these efforts. But now we're there, right? So now that we've kicked off Jordan, next summer we'll kick off Wilson High School or Wilson um, Aquatic Center. We'll be very much in a position to start um, actively engaging in these next steps and next efforts. So I'll continue to update the board in that respect. And then of course our summer intern program. Uh, you know, we do so many things on the facility side of the house and I've done a ton of things in my career in terms of bond program efforts. This is probably the one I'm most proud of. So, and it's just so fun. It's inspiring just to see the work the students do and really inspiring to see how we all came together to develop this program that didn't exist in facilities, right? So historically, we've brought on board at least two interns every summer and we give them the lay of the land. They help us out with a number of activities within the department. This time we want to develop something that's a bit more comprehensive. So really kudos to a number of folks. Uh, first off, Jackie Roberts was our project manager in facilities. She's in the back of the room. She really served as our program coordinator. Um, Jackie and I met late in the spring in my office, had a clean whiteboard, and we developed a seven week program just from scratch. <laughs> Those notes are still, the, still there, Jackie, for reference as well. But uh, you know, it was cool just to see it come together, right? So it started on a whiteboard with a bunch of notes and a seven week program laid out. Um, a bunch of dialogue and cooperation we were gonna seek out from industry partners and professionals and just a number of folks inside and outside of the district. And it all came to fruition, which was just super cool and super neat, right? There's a number of other folks that helped us along the way though. So uh, Cindy Bader and Annetta Leon helped us in terms of the educational program aspect of this. So the kiddos came in, there was 10 of them. Um, they earned a few dollars over the summer. They came in uh, generally Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So they worked a 20-hour week with us over that seven-week stretch. But they also secured a few units. Uh, there was definitely an educational program tied to this effort as well. I think Celeste would agree it, it was a summer well spent. And, and then, of course, I referenced industry partners. There was quite a few of them, right? So we had partnership and collaboration to, to fund the program as well, just in terms of getting the interns paid. But then a, a, a host of presenters and folks that we brought in to speak to these students and also to bring them out to their offices. So I don't want to steal too much of Celeste's thunder. I'll, I'll let her jump in on that piece as well. Um, their activities, and you see a few photos pictured there as well. Some were indoors, some were outdoors, right? You see them fully equipped in, in their appropriate construction attire with hard hat and vest. They received that on day one, day one along with their Chromebooks for the program. Um, and, and we got them front and center. So they were out there on the project site. They, they're doing floor markings to, to identify cracks in asphalt and just a number of things that we typically do on the construction side of the house. And then of course, indoor activities. Um, it included a few field trips. Jackie did a little driving back and forth as well just to get the kids to and from certain engineering offices. But with that, I wanna turn it over to Celeste, let her speak to the program. One of the highlights at the end of the program was the student interns giving a presentation to us. So it was roughly a five to 10 minute presentation, somewhat basically their final project, where they highlighted what they learned and what they picked up on as part of the program. We initially had set out to do this presentation, both me and Jackie, uh, for part of this board workshop. And when we saw those presentations, again, further inspired, and we thought, no chance, we need to bring one of these students interns in so the board can see it firsthand. So with that, come on up, Celeste. Uh, good morning, I'm Celeste Aguilar, and I'm gonna talk about my summer internship experience. So some background, I currently go to Wilson High School. I grew up here in Long Beach, so I went to Bryant Elementary, and I went to Hoover Middle School. Um, if you can see, I have a picture of soccer, and a lot of people, why have a soccer picture on a summer internship? That's what I thought I was gonna do. I always thought I'm gonna go professional in soccer, I'm gonna go pro, like a lot of little girls think. Well, growing up, I was just like, well, maybe that's really not what I'm interested in. In middle school, I got the opportunity to join Long Beach, um, this Long Beach internship I had in middle school, and I got to go fly helicopters, and I got to learn more about planes. And then going into high school, I got the background of just hearing, you need to figure out what you want to do when you grow up. You need to have this pathway. So I kind of went leaning towards engineering, mostly because it was most interesting, and I'm pretty good at math, so that's the only thing that I could think of. So I kind of led more into the engineering side. So I started looking into internships. It was kind of hard to find some because I'm only 16, so not many places would take a 16-year-old. So luckily on my school website, we were able to see this internship opportunity. It was everything that I wanted to see. So I applied and I got in. So the first day, I was very anxious and nervous. I was a little girl, I've never had a job. I've never been on a first day of anything. 
So uh, what helps me a lot, I would read quotes, or I would just read books because I like reading. So I was reading quotes the night before, and I found this quote, the expert in anything was once a beginner. And I think that really stood out to me because I was really nervous that I won't live up to the potential that I had on the interview. But it, that stood out because someone was in my position at least once. And I have nothing to be worried about because everybody knows how I'm feeling, so I could just go with that. Um, so some fortunate things that we got to do during this internship, as you can see, we were at some construction sites. So some photos are me at Wilson and at Bryant. Um, me at Bryant was actually really like momentous since I went to that elementary school. So seeing them fix a lot of things that when I was younger, I would kind of complain about like, oh, it's super hot in here. And then seeing that they're adding the HVAC system is kind of awesome. Like now these kids get to have something that I didn't have. Um, and then at Wilson, I currently go there. So it was able, it was cool to see everything that was going on behind because I was kind of like, oh, it's super loud, or why is the cafeteria closed? I want to go sit in there. So now being able to see everything that's going on behind it, like, oh, I get why it's closed now. Um, and also, we got to get OSHA certified. So here are some photos of um, pictures that I had when I was doing OSHA training. Um, it was really cool because I got to learn about it when I was sitting in the office, and then when I would go out to the construction sites, I would see a lot of the things I was learning about. In the middle is a picture of the certification that I got when I completed the OSHA training. Um, we also got to visit a lot of different companies besides construction sites. So we got to go to the nu nutrition services, which was really cool because I got to see everything that went on behind like our nutrition where we would get for lunch, be just instead of just the packaging that we would get at school, just see everything and the hard work that goes on to our nutrition. We also got to, got to go to MHP which was an engineering firm that talked to us and invited us out into their, to their building, which is cool. We got to talk to a lot of different engineers and hear their progress of what they're doing outside of just talking to us, which is cool because I want to go into engineering, not exactly, not that sure what. So being able to see different engineering positions was kind of cool. Um, what I have learned, I was able to do a lot of slip sheeting when I was out on construction site. It was, really, it was a good time to pass time. Um, I got to learn how to work on specs. What slip sheeting, uh, Celeste? <laughs> um, it's being able, like when they make like addendums, which is like a new plan that they had to fix, we were able to put that on top of the old plan, basically. Um, I got to work on specs with um, an engineer that was at the office, which is a good experience because it was a good time, like to pass time there. Um, I got to learn a lot about construction safety, um, construction terminology, and I got to work on different fields with a lot of different positions in construction because growing up, I just see the construction and it finished. I didn't get to see everything else that went on. I just thought it was a like construction workers and they went to go work. Um, and I also enjoyed a lot of the bonds I created because I feel growing up, creating those bonds for the future being, I remember when a lot of people would come and talk to us about their personal experience, they talked a lot about networking and being able to create the bonds that you've had since you were young. So being able to create these bonds is good because I got their numbers, now I can talk to them, exper um, share experiences throughout high school and college to catch up, which I really enjoyed. Um, and yeah, and in conclusion, I wanted to thank everyone who g made this opportunity happen because now applying to colleges, I kind of have like a leeway of where I want to go after this internship. Yeah. Any questions for Celeste before we, yeah. <laughs> nice job, Celeste. So you're being recorded right now, if you didn't know, and people are watching you. For all of those students out there that were where you were, right? Unsure, a little nervous, not a lot of internship opportunities for a 16-year-old. What would you say uh, to, to that student, uh, having gone through this, what we've heard, a really good experience? I would just say not to give up. There's always something out there for you to find. I was leaning towards giving up, like, oh, I'm not going to find anything. I'll just wait till college to find an internship experience. But do your research. Keep looking. There's going to be something out there, or at least someone willing to give you that opportunity to learn and have the same experience I had. I will just add that we appreciate you working through that nervousness. 
um, you know, anticipation in presenting today and giving us a real insight into how students function in an internship and the opportunities that are available. And I know I speak for um, everyone in this room when we say good luck in your future. And honestly, are you, did you mention you're 15, one five? No, I'm 16, I'm gonna turn 17. Oh, you're, oh, okay, you're 16. Still, I think <laughs> um, you're, you know, you're very mature, you're very smart. I know you're going to do well in your future. So thank you again for coming and sharing with us. Thank you. Thank you, Celeste. I thank appreciate you. So you're going to be, are you going to be a senior? Yeah, I'm going into Wilson? my senior year. So now you have all the behind the scenes scoop for your classmates when they're complaining. I mean, I drive <laughs> by Wilson fairly frequently these days and there's boards up on the windows. Yeah. There's a lot going on. So I'm glad that you will be a point of reference for your school community. Um, and you can tell them all the cool stuff that is worth uh, some of the mess and hassle. But thank you today. Thank and, you. Mr. And Otto may want a tour of what's going on behind the scenes at Wilson. So, uh, so. I, not just behind the scenes. I went, I'm, I'm anxious for all the projects that are uh, in the middle. In fact, uh, I, uh, I remember when they started the, the renovation of the, the 100 building or at, at uh, Wilson, and it seems like it's gone on forever. Uh, but uh, but I heard you say, David, that we're about we're in the middle. Yes. So wh when's the anticipated uh, completion? So anticipated completions the end of next summer. Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. So that, several phases. Building. Even within the building, we, we move like smaller chunks at a time because right. we can only house so many students within the campus at a time right. as well without right. shifting them off site. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's smaller chunks. But we, in essence, move from one, one end of the building to the other to the other. That's why it's taken a while within that particular building as well. And, and the, the uh, aquatic center, you think, will get started after the first of the year in 2022? So for aquatic center, we're looking at summer of 2022. Okay. So we'll jump in. We'll have a slight overlap as we're putting the finishing touches on the HVAC work in the summer uh, during that summer stretch next next year. Mm -hmm. um, we'll kick start and, and break ground on the aquatic center. Okay. And uh, the Lowell uh, uh, portables and lunch show. When is that? When do you think that'll go and get done? So that one's actually more of a summer project for us. So that okay, one's officially sure. underway. It's, it's really just a couple portables and a lunch shelter and a little bit of site work, uh, and it's going well. So that, mm -hmm. that one's making incredible progress. I, I think we're in good shape there to finish okay. up this summer. And, and you say Avalon after the first of the year? Avalon's the project we're slated to start in January of 2022, currently in the bid, bidding phase. Okay. Uh, the, good. Those are those are my district projects. That, so uh, we still had a couple more slides. We realized, Mr. Yep. Miranda, and then Board Member Kerr had an additional. Yeah, I wasn't quite finished. So um, yeah. I respectfully request that Jordan get the title of "It feels like it's going on forever" in terms of construction. <laughs> um, but thank you for your efforts in she the groundbreaking. Um, it was really fun to see your crew out there and folks who have worked behind the scenes on those projects get the opportunity to walk into the auditorium and the media center and sort of see the fruits of their labor in person. So thank you uh, for that and to the mayor and vice mayor for joining us as well. I spoke with Mr. Hannon as well from Building Trades and he is, uh, once school gets started, really excited to step back in with the work um, and really making this uh, agreement be a benefit for our students. So thank you. Um, for that. You made the smart move of speaking before the student, so kudos to you. You never want to follow students, so here you are again, but at least we're exactly. up a little bit. Um, I had one more question and then I, I lost it as we moved. Well, he's got a couple more slides, so maybe you can okay. think about it while he finishes slides. up. It, it'll, yeah. it'll come right back. Yeah. And a few more notes uh, just on the internship program I forgot to mention. Very diverse group. It was great to have all 10 of them. They represented seven high schools in the district, right? So we really kind of spread the love and, and had representation from every part of the boundary, which we were super proud of as well. Part of our discussions was bringing in at least two speakers to each Friday session um, to speak to just, you know, the industry. Uh, so an engineer, an architect, a builder, just different folks, right, from the industry, but also to share personal stories. How'd they get there? Right? And I think what the interns picked up on was there was no cookie cutter path, right? It was not linear. There was just different ways to get to these positions. And I thought that was super cool as well. 
Great. I remembered one thing. It has to do with internships, but Mr. Rising will be interested as well. Um, so I was talking with uh, Josh Lafarga from Laborers, and one of our Lakewood High School star students went through their boot camp two weeks ago and passed and is working on a placement. I just got an update, but uh, he was midway through the week at our groundbreaking, and they said if, if he can get through Wednesday, which apparently is the hardest day of boot camp, it was looking good. But he did uh, pass, so our first Lakewood student uh, passed boot camp. Very nice. And my last note on interns is I've had a series of emails that followed the program. We put out an article via the Bond newsletter as well on the internship program. And there was really interest from the community and from parents in terms of is this program going to continue on for next summer? If so, how do I enroll my, my junior or senior? The other piece which was very cool for us is how do I help fund this program? So it, it was just neat to see that from, from our community at large as well. So switching gears, just two more sections I'm going to highlight relatively quickly here, our facility master plan and our furniture replacement plan. So in terms of the master plan, of course, we engaged in the services of Canon Design uh, to update and really develop a new master plan or roadmap for the district in terms of capital improvement needs and capital improvement projects. They hit the ground running, so they've been doing a lot of work to date, really over the, the summer stretch, uh, focusing in efforts and energies on facility really facility walkthroughs, uh, you know, let, let's get out there, boots on the ground, let's physically walk every one of these spaces and document needs. So they're, they're doing that very activity, they're working in collaboration with our maintenance department and maintenance managers, because oftentimes we get that that's inside scoop, right? So we, we get the additional feedback from the maintenance managers who can shed light on other issues at particular campuses. And we wanna make sure we capture every one of those potential issues on these campuses as well. Um, once we lay out every one of those needs, of course, there's a cost component to it. So we're going to prepare cost estimates and include potential escalation built, built into every one of those line items. Um, again, another one of these activities that has been kind of strategic and intentional is the engagement component to the master plan. So, of, of course, we're documenting needs, we're walking facilities, we're identifying things that are out there. Uh, but at some point, we're going to shift gears, and we want feedback. We want to hear from the community. We want to hear from educators. We want to hear from students. What do they see? What do they envision as a classroom of the future? And how do we incorporate that into this final master plan? I can tell you that as, as the company um, of engineers and architects has walked every one of the facilities, it actually took notice of something cool that we've done here in Long Beach, right? So not only are we embarking on all these facility improvements via the bond in terms of adding and, and replacing HVAC systems, but also that extra step we took in Long Beach, which is adding air filtration systems to every classroom out there that doesn't have it yet, right? So every classroom in the district, you know, come this fall will be outfitted with at least a MERV 13 filter or greater, and we're looking to continue that trend, right? So as large a filter as we can put into any one of these spaces, that continues to be our goal. That's something that will be emphasized as part of the final master plan as well, which is very cool. Now, in terms of the outreach piece and us being strategic, we wanted to wait till the fall to really jump into those efforts, right? We want to make sure folks are back, they're back from the summer and their vacation plans, uh, and they're available to provide that very feedback. Uh, the feedback will come in various different forms, I feel. Maybe it's town halls, maybe it's surveys, maybe it's, you know, one-on-one -on -one contact, just a number of different things that we'll be doing to seek that out. And we are still very much on track to complete this entire effort by next spring. Uh, so next spring, I envision being in front of you presenting a, a draft master plan and then a final master plan. And we can speak to those project priorities and other things that are just kind of stirring up and stemming in terms of absolute great needs district-wide. Um, there's one slide here that just depicts um, some potential concepts and ideas we're thinking about right now in terms of outreach. So you see some of the items I just referenced now in terms of town halls and surveys that we envision. You see students in terms of student voice that we want to capture for this effort and the next effort that I'll be speaking to as well. Uh, but then you see a, a series of different focus groups that we envision, right? So we want to ma make sure we capture uh, the very specific feedback from, you know, a, a number of different folks, whether it be on the education side of the house or the business services side of the house. There's one down below there. I want to make sure it doesn't go unnoticed, uh, sustainability, right? So we envision a sustainability component or tab right off of this master plan. Right, so that, that's gonna be a large effort. We needed quite a bit of feedback and input there, just in terms of where we wanna drive those type of enhancements and improvements going forward as well. And then my last slide here, uh, just a quick update in terms of where we are with furniture replacement plans. So just before the summer, we convened a, a subcommittee with respect to furniture replacements. 
That included a number of different folks um, from the education side of the house. We had representation from each of the level offices. We had folks from, from a number of business services units, including purchasing and transportation, uh, operations side of the house, including some of the folks from our facility side of the house, and, and then a few principals. The purpose of that meeting was just to kickstart the discussion and get folks thinking uh, before they took off for the summer. And, and then we're really gonna engage that group here as we come back this fall, really in the next month or so. We've been doing a few additional things on our side of the house, um, just in terms of vetting out different suppliers and manufacturers of modern classroom furniture. Um, our thought and our vision is to bring a bunch of samples in, right? Let, let's, let's have folks kind of kick the tires on it, so to speak, and, and really feel out what this furniture looks like. Uh, again, I referenced student input. Let's hear from the students. Uh, what works, what doesn't, what's most comfortable? Uh, do we want the ability to move around and collaborate and do things as a group? and just as easily separate off and work individually as well. In many cases, the furniture is what allows us to do that, right? So that's a piece that, that we set forth and set in motion as a subcommittee. We tasked folks with inviting a few additional members to the subcommittee because specifically we want some teacher input and some student input. And our thought was these two things are kind of running parallel, right? So we tasked those folks with name, naming a few individuals at the same time, we're vetting out uh, certain manufacturers and suppliers so we can get some of this stuff in place and actually see it and feel it firsthand as well. Um, really what we want from the subcommittee is feedback and input. It, it, it's, this can go any which way. Uh, we know teachers pivot daily in terms of instruction. We want the furniture to pivot as well, right? So that's one of our primary goals. We want to hear the goals and the metrics from teachers and students as well though, right? Uh, just so it's not facilities driving, it's, it's really the end users driving this as well. Um, we'll work hard on developing an implementation timeline. So once we gather the feedback, kick the tires on certain things, vet out what delivery schedules look like, we'll put together a phasing plan, right? So what does it look like? How does it marry up to some of our building program efforts so we're not inconveniencing folks and sites on more than one occasion, right? Let, let's try and marry that up with those construction efforts so we get the old furniture out, new furniture in at that very time. That's not gonna be possible or feasible in every case, but let's leverage those situations as best we can as well. Um, so I, I envision circling back in, in terms of what that implementation schedule looks like at, at a future board workshop as well. David, I just wanna add a comment around the classroom infrastructure. So again, part of our learning acceleration and support plan, um, while many districts do not have a robust bond program that is doing the work of all that you heard David talk about today, we do. So we're fortunate that our investments are, while well, many districts across the country are making investments in infrastructure, in HVAC and other systems, we're able to direct more of our money to students. But this is a great example, so David's talking about it really simply. This is $45 million, mm -hmm. likely over the course of three to four-ish years to implement, and a huge endeavor. Um, but a great opportunity for us to make that investment out of our federal relief money. Thank you, Dr. Baker. And quite a bit of input we've already heard from some of the folks we invited to that initial kickoff session, right? So how does this coincide with some of the technology improvements in the classroom? Uh, what happens with the old furniture as we surplus things out of these classrooms, right? So which is why we have transportation and the warehouse folks in the mix. From an operation standpoint, if there's more movable furniture, what are the wheels like? How does that impact potential seams on carpet, right? So we wanna make sure we vet out anything and everything um, before we kick into this massive effort. That's my last slide. I can field any additional questions. Any additional questions? Yeah, just um, thank you for the timeline on the master plan outreach, and thank you for putting the sustainability piece in. I know our uh, poly, I say poly green schools initiative, we know um, that they've invited students from more schools now, so it's not just poly, but those students are really interested in participating and giving meaningful impact on what that looks like in terms of sustainability, so I'd love to see um, specific meetings to sustainability so not just one of those general meetings where someone can come in and talk about it but really some specific outreach to those students who have done a lot of research um, i know mr rising you've been working with them and dr baker's been on meetings with them uh, this week but i think that's a great opportunity for them to have a real meaningful contribution to reach some of the goals that they're trying to reach that's great ditto and i'm meeting with them this week uh, as well so ditto on that so thank you mr uh, miranda i think um, two things, I like the fact that we will have this master plan uh, draft next summer, but I think one of the things that I've appreciated is 
uh, keeping us updated in the community via social media uh, as well, whether those are shots of projects and or folks uh, in action uh, at the work site. So thanks for all the work you're doing. That's great, thank you. Dr. Baker, I think we're at recess. Uh, so thank you to all of our presenters the last uh, day and a half. Uh, for those members of the community that came and, and provided public comments, thank you. Thank you to all of our staff uh, for a lot of information that we received, but I think we made really good use of time. Thanks to my colleagues uh, for their engagement. Uh, and we will be uh, back in closed session in a couple hours. Okay, thank you. <laughs>